Good morning. This meeting will be compliance with Nebraska's open meeting laws. If you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will convene first as the Douglas County Board of Equalization. Mr. Clerk, could you please have the roll call? Commissioner Borgeson? Present. Commissioner Boyle? Here. Uh, Commissioner Cavanaugh is not here yet. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Commissioner Kraft is present virtually but cannot vote. Commissioner Rogers? Here. And Mr. Chair? Present. Thank you. Uh, the first item for consideration is the approval of the minutes from Tuesday, September 1. I can we include item B, which is calling for a meeting on September 22nd as the date for the hearing on certified assessment corrections? Is that okay to be part of the motion? Okay, motion by Commissioner Rogers, second by Commissioner Morgan to approve items A and B. Questions or comments? Mr. Clerk, could we please vote? And uh, since I don't have access to the votes, I'm just guessing when you guys are done. So, <laughs> motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Citizen comments. Would anybody like to address the Board of Equalization on anything not on the agenda? This is the opportunity to do so. Yours, Mr. Bowman. Um, my name is Monty Bowman with Averis. Um, we've been trying to find a way where we can do this in a structured way to show where we found a lot of problems with the referee system this year. We had warned about it prior in the year. It wasn't just procedural errors. We had a lot of non-uniformity. Uh, too many people uh, not playing with the same set of rules. Uh, simple rules that appraisers should have known um, how long are comparables good for. Some of them knew it, some of them didn't. Uh, besides the lost evidence, which will be coming up here as well, one of the procedural errors where confession of judgment had been used in the past was there had been a um, husband and wife filed a protest. The wife did the protest herself, husband ran the business. She became terminally ill, passed away, uh, won unanimously by the referee and the coordinator, and it was dismissed. It was during his grieving period, he didn't get his appeal filed, but we had been up here at the board, and it had been determined that procedural errors such as that, if a person filed their appeal to Turk, uh, once they had their case number, then they could ask then to start a confession of judgment through county attorney. And what we are wanting to do is to show enough procedural errors other items for clients that did file their appeals because doing the confession Adios. of judgment, the evidence is going to change if they have to go to church. Mr. Bowman, I'm sorry. Folks who are on the Zoom call, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. And we're just trying to find a way to get it in front of the board somewhere where these people can ask for a confession of judgment if they can show these procedural errors occurred. And we'd be more than happy to show every bit of them that occurred because we did an audit of all 203 pages of all the protests that were filed looking for the 4% that were just commercial and industrial. It's the only two that we were looking at specifically. And these errors run throughout all of them. And it's not just mine. There are other business owners that are here as well. 
So we're just looking for a way or an opportunity to be able to show the board exactly what happened and how that problem can be fixed. There's already something in place. Mr. Bowman, sorry. Emily Smith, you need to mute yourself. Thank you. Ms. Smith, please mute yourself. We're unable to do it for you. Please continue, Monty. That's what we're trying to get up here in front of the board is, is there a way we can structurally have it to where these clients can show that there was some type of an error committed where they should be able to get a confession of judgment to try to get a fair referee hearing. There's a lot of simple ways to do it. The page that you have on your website prior to us ever filing a protest, we share to the owners because it shows the documentation they're allowed to bring. The only problem is, is that it isn't completely detailed enough, so the comparative market analysis, uh, the broker's opinion of value, which two of the clients, not mine, but two people did provide those items this year and they were ignored because there's nothing on the website, there's nothing that is given to the referees that shows them this is the set of rules. If everybody's got the same set of rules, it'll be a lot easier to take and conduct these hearings and they're not breaking it down that the comparables are good for three years. If you just recently purchased it, it's good for three years. How long is that evidence good for? They're asking for rent rolls. They're asking for income statements. Yes, but how long is it good for? Because not all the referees agree. They don't know that there's a three-year rule. Some of them don't, some do. Yes. So, so we're ending up with completely inconsistent decisions across the board. We won on three or four where we said I'm comparing my dirt's 375, all my neighbors at 225. Some of the referees said you can argue that way. Then we have 34 decisions that specifically they said you can't take those individual pieces and do that. So none of the rules are being followed across the board. And that's the same way with the coordinators. We did also have one that the coordinator and the referee agreed and said he won, and it was dismissed. Same way before, this one did file their appeal to Turk. So we have straight procedural errors, and then we have the non-uniformity, which runs through probably almost 80 of these commercial and industrial properties. And they make up a small percentage of all of the protests that are filed, but the amount of mistakes and errors that run through it is 50, 60, 70 percent of them. They're even asking taxpayers why did you only use one approach to income or one approach to value? That's, that question doesn't come up on your page. Why would they have to know that? They just know that you said income, well, I don't make that much. You said I paid this much. No, this is what I paid. Not income approach, not the cost approach, only an appraiser approaches it that way. So for him questioning you doing that doesn't make any sense. And on our agenda coming up, you're going to see a couple of those examples. Otherwise, we do have one owner who is here, but the evidence that he needs to present has to be something more visual that you can see because his property ended up doubling in size, doubling his value. He changed from a one-story to a two-story, kept changing from a restaurant to a bar, retail store, these classification changes have happened consistently from 14, 17, and again in 20. And when you walk into his place, it's confusing because you see Nate stumble in, but it's actually a restaurant. And when you walk into a landing, there's a sign that says dining room down, banquet up. There's nothing about a bar, it just happens to have one in it. There's only nine stairs up, nine down. Full flight of stairs is 14 to 16 stairs but they still call it a two-story, and they doubled his size, and it was a one-story for years. Those are the type, types of things that we showed the referees, and they said that there was nothing convincing in it that would change that. In two sentences, what do you want us to do? Set it up so we can at least show. Set it up. We can give you an outline of what Excuse these me. people are asking. Excuse me, set it up, did you say? We can. We can put together an outline for you of specifically a process to request confession of judgment and okay. why. Why don't you do that? Put it, put it in writing to us in about just a couple of sentences. Don't go on because it doesn't help. Just a couple of sentences say you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this. Thank you. Okay? Okay. And that put it together the steps to show that this Thanks. has actually occurred. 
I don't, I, I, I'm just saying you cannot go on for hours about it and talk about how many stairs there are in a building. That doesn't help. Yeah, because you're not going to see give it. Us a nutsh give us, in a nutshell, tell us, I need to have you move this to this place so I can get in. I need to have parking for this. I need to have this done it short, concise. Tell us what you need, and we'll tell you if we can do it. But don't don't go on and on and on and on about everything. Okay, I'll help. put something together for two. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this brings us to resolutions D through F. Motion to approve and adjourn. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't turn the page. What? I did not turn the page. We're not ready to adjourn yet. Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah, it would be D through L are the resolutions on, on the agenda. The, and uh, I just know there there is, um, in addition to Mr. Bowman on item G, there's probably going to be a speaker. So if we wanted to pull right. items. <clears throat> All right, let's just do D through F for the moment then, which was your motion, I think, Mike. Yes. You're, you're okay with that? Yes. We have a second? Sure. Right, we have a motion and a second to approve resolutions D through F. If there are questions or comments to this, uh, could we please vote? One moment, please. Okay, thank you. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Next we have uh, resolution G, certified assessment correction, uh, dealing with Four parcels for Glassman property, Philip Glassman, KGP Holdings, and Kyle J. Phillips. What, what is the pleasure of the board? I've got a question. Okay. All right. We have a motion to uh, approve item G. Is there a second? I'll second it. We'll right. Thank you. And now you had a question, Commissioner. Well, Bowles. I just wondered if there's anybody here to, to speak on these, or were these people notified of uh, these well, changes? Well, these were late from last week. Okay. Uh, the Glassman, or two weeks ago. So are they? Nobody's <laughs> going to speak on them. I, well, they're they're both present. Both owners are present on the Zoom call. I think Mr. Phillips is oh, not planning on speaking, but Mr. Okay. or Mrs. Glassman may. Thanks. That's all I want to know. Thank you. Did Did you have? On, on, on this like. one, yes. Uh, Mike Goodwillie, Douglas County Assessor, Register of Deeds Office. Um, I am not going to speak on the, the merits, more on the mechanics of some of this. Thank you. Um, in, in our view, uh, you've hired these professional appraisers to review this, and for the most part, we're not interested in getting in the way. But what I would mention on this item is there is a duplex owned by Mr. Phillips or Mr. Phillips' company that's located at 31st and Marcy. And it is TIFT. It's in a tax increment finance project. And initially, uh, which means there are two account numbers, one for the base and one for the excess. Um, so. There is a spreadsheet um, attachment A that came along with this. If you had that, I would point out to you that the base value was $78,900. The excess was $232,800, and I think the total value was a little in excess of $311,000. Um, it looks like the referee has rec uh, made a recommendation to reduce the base parcel, but to leave the excess alone. Um, that's absolutely the opposite of what by law should happen. Um, when uh, value for a property in a TIF project is changing, that change should operate first by law on the excess rather than the base. Um, a base can be decreased, but only if there's no more excess left. So my suggestion to you, um, although we're not sure we entirely agree with the referee recommending a, rec a, a reduction here, but it looks like they recommended a reduction of $11,200 
to this duplex. If you are going to agree with that recommendation, that needs to be, uh, that needs to come off of the excess parcel rather than the base. And Mr. Goodwillie, we, uh, the, now the one that went forward to the board last week, you are correct. The one for this week, I noted that and we switched it around. Okay. okay. So the base, the base is being left the same and the excess is being recommended that's, to be That's reduced. exactly what should happen. So um, if you wish to ad adopt the referee's recommendations on the, on this particular item, my only suggestion to you would be the, the recommendation they're making on parcel 232-182-0576 be applied to its companion parcel 232-182-0578. Mr. Chair, I and, have a question one. And that is being recommended, just so you know. The spreadsheet in front of you reflects what Mr. Goodwillie is, uh, and he, he's the one who brought it to our attention, so we made those changes after he, after he did that. Thank you. Commissioner Boyle. Mr. Goodwillie, is there a, isn't there a law that uh, when a person uh, gets TIF that they agree not to uh, appeal the valuation it's, for certain it's, number It's of not a law. What the City of Omaha does is as part of their uh, tax increment finance agreement with the developer, they enter into an agreement with that developer that the developer will not protest the value down below a certain point. Um, quite frankly, I'm not sure how enforceable that is. Um, and we're not the TIF agreement cops, um, no. and I don't know if and, and I don't know if Mr. Phillips um, signed off on that contract or he's like a secondhand purchaser. In our experience, if you're the developer of the TIF, Commissioner Boyle, and you sign that agreement, but then you saw, saw, sell a parcel to Commissioner Duda, Commissioner Duda doesn't give a darn about, about the agreement you signed with the city of Omaha. Well, the city might. So I can, can I chime in real quick? Uh, I, anytime when a TIF property is protested, our office contacts Bridget Hadley in the City of Omaha Planning Department, and if there's an issue with it, she contacts a property owner, and a lot of times they just withdraw the protest. Uh, in Mr. Phillips' case, I know I spoke to myself to Ms. Hadley about this, and uh, apparently there's no problems. I mean, I, I think had the recommendation been by quite a bit of money, probably there would have been an issue, but it's, since it's going from a total of 311 to just 300,000. Uh, she did not say this to me, it's just my presumption is that they don't have a problem with the recommendation. Um, so, but the, the city planning is aware that this person is protesting the property valuation. Well, I think we ought to explore that a little further because uh, uh, saying we don't, we don't care um, affects the valuation and the money that goes to political subdivisions. So I'd like to get that very, very clearly s satisfied. And the other thing is that uh, I, I believe that an agreement with the uh, city over a piece of real estate property that's uh, uh, properly filed with the Register of Deeds would, uh, uh, would apply to uh, later buyers. So I think if you make an agreement with the government to do this and not to appeal uh, for 15 years or whatever it is, that it applies to future buyers as well. I don't, uh, it's, it should anyway, if they're not filing something correctly, that's not right. C Commissioner, that's... That that's maybe a perfectly reasonable presumption. What what I would simply say is this: um, if if you know you mentioned that the the amount of uh, tax dollars that go to the political subdivisions needs to be protected, and that's absolutely right, and that's why by law any kind of reduction can, it should only come off the excess. That's why that's why I'm making the recommendation I make. That's good. Okay, but I'd like to have us make sure we can go ahead and I guess we can approve this. It's only a small amount of money, but I think we need to make sure that, that the city is uh, you know, protecting all of everybody's interest in this and if there is a, an agreement that it applies to future buyers. That's pretty uh, serious. Well, I'll, I'll just reiterate, I spoke to the person who was heavily yeah. involved in these TIP right. projects and she didn't express any concerns, so. Well, let's right. get it in writing. <laughs> all, right. all right. The motion before us is to uphold the referee's recommendations on those items in item G. Further questions or comments to the motion before us? If not, I would ask for the vote. Uh, Okay, I, um, I'm just surprised that the Glassmans didn't want to say anything, but I will go ahead and start, the, right. start the... Are they? Uh, Ms. Glassman, did you want to say anything, or Phil, if you're on the phone? Not Kyle Phillips, but Phil Glassman. Okay. All right. Well, we did see that you unmuted, but we're not hearing anything. Let's go ahead and vote. Yeah. 
Okay, well, the vote will begin. Motion passes five to one. Commissioner Boyle voting no. All other commissioners voting yes. Thank you. This brings us to item H. Um, we have three parcels here uh, for consideration. Okay, we have a motion to approve item H to Uphold the referees. I believe this would be upholding the referees' recommendation. Yeah, and these three properties are recommending changes. Okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second to accept the referees' recommend recommended changes in item H. Mr. Chair, could I ask, how did these get on our agenda? What I don't understand. Who's bringing these? The referees bringing these, or who is it? It's, uh, or, or we are. Dan Ash, County Clerk. So uh, basically, these are. There's various situations. <laughs> And they these they get brought to our attention after the fact, and in these three parcels, the referees made comments and the written comments that are provided to the homeowner or our property owner and protester. Uh, the comments stated there was no supporting documentation submitted, and there was. So I can only speculate as to how it was missed, but we acknowledged. You know, I mean, we looked into it, and yes, there was supporting documentation submitted by the protester. So we asked the referee coordinator to please re-review the, the complete protest because you obviously didn't look at all the documentation submitted. They did, and then they brought, and then they decided that. And we, and this wasn't, you I know, mean, these are when these claims are made, we always make sure that this stuff was submitted on time, and it was. And uh, it was just. An error on on our part that, that caused all the documentation not to get reviewed. And once the referee coordinator did review all of it, he uh, came up with a different recommendation for these three protests. Okay. But my question is, if this if this is you know there's three properties here, and if there were mistakes or, that we made, uh, I think it it just highlights the ineffectiveness of the board of equalization hearing these appeals. I, I mean, if how many others are out there that didn't? You know have about to look at item eleven as well because there are. There were 10 total evidence lost, and okay, they Mr. were Bob, all reviewed. Yeah, Three yeah. were approved, and seven are again okay, on well, the agenda. Well, that's not my question. My question really is that if, there's, if there are 15 or 20 of these people, what about the rest? So I think we need to really look at uh, our whole procedures pretty thoroughly to see what's, what's happened here. Because I'm sure there's other taxpayers out there that are, don't have the benefit of this. So that's right. I'll, uh, let's go ahead and proceed with whatever. I'll, we made the motion to approve, didn't we, or did we? we yeah. But I'm questioning the mount on one of these, the Vada, boom, the very first one. That is a hotel on 70th and Grover. And I sent to Dan Esch because there was a big confusion. This hotel was bought during June when they were trying to do the personal property return for the hotel. So it wasn't completed until about the 13th of June, the, half, the sale happened on the 19th, and they were filing the protest at the same time. So Mr. Musto, uh, the coordinator, said he determined the value was $6,800,000. I sent a copy of the personal tax return, which was completed for 266000 We just asked that the $6.8 million reduce the 266000 from the total because personal property he's paying on that anyways for the return, so it should be taken off of the total 6.8, which he put down as total consideration in his notes to Dan. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Ferguson, please. Would you say that one more time? You want out of the 6.8, how much do you want taken off? The personal property, property return is 266,000, I think 120, something like that. 120,000 of that? 266,120 dollars. That's the amended tax return that I sent to Dan. Um, what, so what's the total property valuation you're, requ you're requesting today? For that property, it's the six million eight, which is what Musto requi uh, requested. Right. And then I sent the tax return, which was two sixty six one twenty. That should come off of the six point eight. Should be five point six point five. 
Correct. Yep. Okay. It's not a big adjustment, but it's it was a little. Agrees with me <laughs> <anyway>. <laughs> but that was the only only one on those three. Okay. The maker and the seconder of the motion. Are you amenable to that uh, as a friendly amendment? All right. To reduce the six point eight million to six million five hundred thirty-three thousand eight hundred eighty dollars. Yeah. All right. Then that is how the motion now reads. Okay. Questions or comments to the motion as it sit, sits now? Then could we please vote? Give me one moment, please. Well, you got Ellen's flying finger back. I expected that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Morgan, how did you vote? Yes. Yes, okay, motion passes six to zero. Thank you. This brings us then to item I. Um, Three more corrections, certified assessment corrections. Uh, again, having to do with supporting documentation, not getting reviewed by the referees in a timely fashion. These do have changes in valuation that are recommended uh, by the referees. What is the pleasure of the board? Motion to approve. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Rogers to approve item I. Any questions or comments? Then could we please vote? And Commissioner Borgeson. Oh, voting yes. Okay, motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Brings us to item J. We have two items here. Uh, again, changes in valuation are being recommended. Motion to approve. Pardon me. All right. Questions or comments to item J? Then could we please vote? Commissioners Borgeson and Kavanaugh, how do you vote? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Borgeson, you did show up. I apologize. I'm missing uh, uh, Commissioner Rogers. You vote yes, Commissioner Rogers? Okay. Motion passes 6 to 0. I have a question on I. I. Not oh, no. shocks. I just want to make sure that I understood you correctly. I'm Armstrong, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you approved that it's going to be uh, evaluation. The valuation, the change. We, yes. We upheld the refer the referee's recommendation of a change. Okay, so that's all I need then. Okay. So paperwork goes forward from here. Right. I think We've had a hard time getting to this point. <laughs> right. I'm just trying to cover my tracks as I go now. Okay. Well, I think you beat City Hall. You beat City Hall. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't declare that just <laughs> Okay. So right. we will receive something in the mail? Yes, Mr. Armstrong. The clerk's office will send you notification showing the new valuation that was approved today. I appreciate that. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. We will move on to item K. We have two parcels under item K. Um, there are no changes being recommended on these two parcels by the referees. What is the pleasure of the board? Motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Boyle. Is that Commissioner Rogers second uh, on item K? Questions or comments? Then I would call for the vote, please. Okay. 
Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. This brings us then to item L, where we have a number of properties. Uh, there are no changes being recommended by our referees on these. Good morning again, Mr. Bowman. Um, one of, we've got problems where I think on every one of these, we need to take an address and show where there's problems on them, but there's one specifically, they talk about 175, uh, 25 gold plaza. Uh, in the evidence that was presented with it, Mr. Musto did put his final numbers down and he found that the county assessor's net uh, NOI was 116,274. Now he took the, uh, this is a neighborhood shopping center and this client submitted the exact same profit loss statements for two shopping centers. In this case, what Mr. Mis Mr. Musto did was he determined from the paperwork what the NOI would be for the property owner. And his three years came up to 115,105 and 105, which never once reached the 116,000 of the county assessor. And he says, no change. Well, it changes it from 1.45 to 1.358 million, or $94,000 just on his numbers. So this one should have actually been approved and that's why I think there needs to be clarification on this one and a few of the other ones on this list because according to this, it should have been approved. The numbers say it was. So instead, I'm sorry. Commissioner Borgeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So instead of the 1.453500, it should be what? Uh, it's 1,453,425. And then the actual amount would be 1,358,563. That's using the same cap rate as the county assessor. It's just using his final NOI average. It's $94,862 difference. Say the difference again. 96,000 or 94,862. That's on the NOI, not on, NOI. on the value. But he used that to calculate what yep. it was, and that's the, where the difference was. So, I mean, his notes specifically says 116, and there was only one year that they got close to 115. The other two years were at about 105. So just looking at that, I was going, added up his numbers, and if he would have finished, but not all of the referees would do this, take the numbers and show you at least some of the formula, because then you can check the numbers. That's part of the uniformity problem, because his other, other property, had a completely different referee who didn't even determine the NOI, this we could at least see where there was an error because we could see some of the numbers. That's why I said the uniformity drove us nuts and then when we added this up, they're going, it doesn't make any difference. 2,200 a year in taxes, I think is still quick, still pretty good, substantial amount. All right, I would ask the maker and seconder of the motion what your pleasure is at this point. I'm ready to vote. As, as is? Yes. Seconder? Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Borgeson. Well, I think he makes a good point, though, in changing it from the 1.453500 to 1.358563. Again, he's got the numbers to verify the, I guess, the, the error that was, that was made in the calculation of the value. So um, would you guys be amenable to changing that one to 1.3? Well, the figure. 58563. What was the Friendly figure again? Amendment. Okay, that's fine. All right. One, one, right. three, five, eight, five, six, three. Would be the new value on the Morris um, Heritage. LLC. One, seven, five, two, five, gold. Yeah. Gold yes. Plaza. All right, so that's accepted as a friendly amendment. That's how the motion now sits. Questions or comments to the motion as it sits? If not, I would. Does this include, can the motion include adjournment? I'm yes. not aware of need for executive yeah. session. All right. Then I would call for the vote. One moment, please. All right, just so, because I know how this is going to go, Mr. Bowman, you're going to question this number. So we're approving $1,358,563 for 17525 Gold Plaza. Right. All right, so we're all straight on that. Yep. Right.
the other ones I'll address later. Commissioner Cavanaugh, how do you vote? Yes, okay, motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Uh, this brings us then to the Board of Corrections. Could we please have the roll call yeah. for the Board of Corrections? Commissioner Borgeson. Present. Commissioner Boyle. Here. Commissioner Cavanaugh. Here. Commissioner Kraft is present virtually. Can our vote? Commissioner Morgan here. Commissioner Rogers. And Mr. Chair. Here. Thank you. Item one is approval of the minutes from the Board of Corrections meeting held August 25th. So move. Second. Questions or comments? And could we please vote on that? Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Citizen comments, would anybody like to address the Board of Corrections on anything that is not on the agenda? If not, we will turn to the report from our Director of Corrections, Dr. Mike Myers. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Michael Myers, Director of Corrections for Douglas County. Uh, I'll jump right in. Enclosure number one, administrative services. Following the second month of the fiscal year, we are over budget by $1,473,664. I do want to point out that the vast majority of that is due to CARES related purchases that have not been credited back to our budget as of yet. There was $334,041 spent on overtime during the month of August. That was a decrease of $23,000 from the previous month. Uh, we did have a spike of overtime due to COVID-19 related absences during August, um, especially during the second half of the month. Uh, since we are paid in arrears, I expect that that expense to hit us uh, in my September report, um, which I'll uh, provide to you next month. And closure number two, community corrections and in-house programs. Uh, due to the drastic impact of COVID-19 on community corrections activities, uh, our data are significantly different than the norm. Many of our staff have been repurposed to allow essential functions to continue. Uh, during a significant outbreak of COVID-19 among staff and incarcerated individuals, or excuse me, due to a significant outbreak, uh, work release, the reentry assistance program, or RAP, our therapeutic communities in the jail, our GED program, and the law library were all suspended throughout the month of August. Several CARES Act related renovations projects are getting underway at the Criminal Justice Center uh, to take advantage of the temporary closure of that facility. Our reentry services staff have had significant portions of their workday converted to facilitating online court hearings and other legal functions. Combined, they facilitated 490 court hearings and facilitated 38 hours of review of discovery materials. Our 24-7 sobriety program has also been changed drastically during the pandemic in order to minimize face-to-face -face interactions. And we have seen and continue to see an increase in the rate of violations, especially for drug <coughs> testing, um, due to that lack of immediacy um, in, in frequency of testing. 40 individuals were placed on the program. There were 1,857 breath tests administered using remote testing technology. 27 were positive for alcohol use. There were also two no-shows. The breath testing compliance rate was 99.9%. .9%. 27 individuals were monitored for 621 days of scram monitoring. There were zero no-shows, one tampering violation, and zero alcohol violations. The SCRAM compliance rate was also 99.9%. There were 39 uh, saliva drug tests administered with two violations. And there were 72 drug testing patches submitted for testing with 37 violations. Work release was closed throughout the month. House arrests admitted 69 individuals. 
The Reentry Assistance Program was closed throughout the month. Corrections programs in our therapeutic communities were also closed during the month. Free trial services continues to provide daily information to the courts regarding for candidates for bond reduction and early pleas in response to the, end, the pandemic. 15 individuals were referred for priority prosecution, saving 142 bed days. 292 individuals were placed on pretrial release. Over the course of the month, 1,244 individuals were managed on pretrial release with an 87% compliance rate and the law library was closed throughout the month. I do want to mention that we did reach out to um, Tom Riley and his staff regarding the law library access. Um, we are still providing some services directly on a one-on-one -on -one basis for, for folks as, as we can. We just have the, had to take the position where we could not bring people together into one room at the same time uh, during the outbreak. In closer number three, compliance. Our third year uh, ACA documentation is being gathered. Uh, we're actually coming down the home stretch for that. We are nearly prepared for our upcoming audit, um, probably late October or the first week of November. And what I've learned actually just this week, it will sort of be a hybrid um, approach. They will, a lot of the audit will be done virtually where we will scan and send documentation to them demonstrating compliance with their standards, but they will also send a smaller number of auditors than usual um, for a shorter period of time to visit the jail in person and community corrections in person uh, so that they can physically verify that we're in compliance with their standards. In closure number three, uh, personnel. Uh, 13 officers graduated from the training academy on August 21st. Uh, 12 officers, all below the rank of sergeant, left employment in August. Um, the impact of shift bidding in COVID-19, in, in addition to our typical attrition, may have contributed to this increase. This is the second month in a row we've had a higher rate of attrition. Uh, one of the things that, when things maybe regain some, some sense of normalcy, that I want to work on is we, we do tend to lose staff after the, in the month or two after shift bidding each every six months um, as staff may get assigned to shifts that just don't work for their personal life, child care, et cetera. Um, that's a tough nut to crack to figure out how to, how to resolve that, but, um, but it is worth uh, the effort, I think, to try, and, to try and figure out if there is some middle ground we can reach with the union on that. Um, Sergeant Walter Cummings uh, also retired in August, and we talked about him um, last month. Um, we concluded the month having 370 of our 396 authorized uniform staff. That's a net loss of 11. We anticipate a class of 20 to, 20 to 25 new officers to begin training on September 25th. Um, so that should do at least get us back up to where we were a couple of months ago in our staffing levels. In closure number five, population. We had 1,338 admissions. Um, that's a decrease from the previous month. There were 1,278 releases. Typically our admissions numbers and our release numbers are almost identical. I think we had a, there was the disparity this time due to um, court transports being suspended from the jail due to the COVID outbreak for, for two weeks during August. Um, that resulted probably in some people staying in custody longer um, because their court hearings were unable to be held. Um, our high count was uh, 1213. Our low count was 1,152. Our average daily population did increase, it was 1,182. Um, also contributing to that is the closure of the Criminal Justice Center, um, not being able to house folks over there, um, it bolstered the numbers inside of the jail as well. Uh, custodial bank sanctioned bed days um, were 36, and again, I've said this to you in other months, I really wanna give um, credit to probation for being very creative 
and finding other ways besides incarceration to hold their folks accountable. Um, every month this number gets lower when I didn't think it could get lower um, the previous month. This number used to be up to you know around 500 bed days per month. Um, so they have really been re responded well um, to um, adapting in the, in, in the pandemic. The U.S. Marshall population increased, the ICE population decreased, the felony pretrial population increased slightly, the misdemeanor pretrial population decreased, and probation violations remain steady. The female population, <clears throat> excuse me, has increased. Uh, one of the four female housing units has been, has been designated as our quarantine unit. However, at the conclusion of the month, and actually since then, we have been have we have uh, opened up a fourth female housing unit because of increased numbers of females in the jail. In closure number six, medical, now, there were 1,245 intake screenings and 362 physical and health assessments. Inmates were sent out to the hospital 17 times for emergent medical care. Six of those were by 911. There were five hospital admissions, which resulted in 14 days of hospitalization. In closure number four, or excuse me, seven, mental health, there were 54 initial psychiatric assessments. There were 92 initial mental health assessments. There were 58 mental health infirmary placements. There were three board of mental health referrals and two transfers uh, to long-term psychiatric facilities, namely the Lincoln Regional Center which after their outbreak of COVID earlier in the summer has now resumed transport. Other noteworthy items, um, we continue to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. August was the most difficult month to date in the battle with COVID-19. At one point, 50 staff were out simultaneously with positive COVID-19 tests. This placed a tremendous stress on, on DCDC as a whole to maintain critical operations in the face of a significant staffing shortage. In addition to the stress and worry of individual officers, in addition, the stress and worry for individual officers and their families was profound. Um, I did have a story of a, one of our staff who was positive, who then also his infant son got it. So it, it is, oh my God. Um, you know, our staff deserve a lot of gratitude um, for what they've uh, persevered through and sacrificed this year. In addition to the previous closure of community corrections, other operations were scaled back during the month in order to staff security posts. Our staff are to be commended for their efforts throughout the pandemic, but especially during the month of August when they faced when be often faced with mandatory overtime and, uh, and a higher risk than normal to their personal well-being. We increased the level of PPE during August, substituting N95 masks for cloth masks and implementing protective eyewear. This appears to be having an impact on the rate of transmission of the virus in the jail, as we've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of staff and incarcerated individuals impacted in recent weeks. Um, as of this morning, uh, we had one staff member who was out. Um, actually who's been kind of battling it for a few weeks. So I, we haven't had any new infections for a couple of weeks for our staff. And we are down to from nine housing units that were on an isolation or quarantine status down to two, one of which being our quarantine unit um, and one of which being our infirmary uh, for females where we just have one female who, um, who has a positive test who's in our infirmary in a negative pressure room. So things are thankfully uh, much better on this front uh, than when I spoke to you a month ago. Uh, court transports, as I mentioned earlier, were halted for two weeks during August, during August due to the number of housing units impacted by COVID-19. We also increased the uh, amount of PPE worn by defendants attending court. Uh, we worked um, hand in hand with the Sheriff's Department um, with um, county, district, federal, juvenile court, all, all of the above um, to 
um, develop some new protocols for our inmates when they're being transported. Um, and basically, they were wearing face shields. Um, they were ha they got upgraded masks when they went to court. Uh, we put hand sanitizer in the transport vehicles and made that available to the sheriff's office um, it, in order to alleviate the concerns that the courts rightfully had about protecting their courtrooms from infection. And court transports resumed just prior to the end of the month. Um, proposals were received for and evaluated for pretrial release software, a body scanner, and tablet devices for the incarcerated population. Uh, the purchasing process of those items um, is commencing now in September. Um, requests for proposals were published for body-worn cameras, and those proposals will be received and evaluated in, a, in the coming weeks. We have also moved forward with numerous CARES-related purchases and projects. Renovations to improve airflow and social distancing have been quickly planned and are being initiated. We are also purchasing many products which will aid in the sanitizing and disinfecting of the entire Department of Corrections campus. And with that, I'm ready for your questions. Well, let me start off by saying you and your staff are doing an absolutely amazing job under very trying circumstances. And, and I wish there were more we could do to show our support and appreciation for what they're doing. It's most impressive. Thank you. Questions or comments to the director, Commissioner Boyle? Mr. Kavanaugh, is up. Oh. Go ahead. I just didn't know he didn't know you were asking. Let me, I wanted to ask um, if I could on uh, some of the acronyms that you use. The only one that I, I always forget is SCRAM. If when you could you spell out what that is? Sure. Or just um, like you do the other ones. That um, I don't know if I could tell you what SCRAM means. <laughs> you don't have to dismiss. But I can tell you what it is. Um, okay. It is the it is the brand name for the ankle bracelet. Oh yeah. Which people right. wear to detect alcohol use through their okay. skin. Okay, if you just spell out what the what it is before the word the acronym, that'd be helpful. And we'll do that. Uh, that was on behalf of uh, Commissioner Kraft. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, not really, I'm just joking. <laughs> I wanted to ask about bail. Uh, we we talked yes. about trying to do something about people that are stuck uh, in your facility uh, due to being un unable to pay bail. Are we making any progress? I know you're you're taking care of a lot of good people and getting them moved up and accelerating things. Uh, but I, I uh, and I don't want to ask you for more reports, but uh, I, I'd be interested in knowing how many people are, you know, are in the uh, facility uh, that are sitting there with, you know, a uh, uh, $500 bail or less. And um, so I don't, Commissioner Borgerson worked on this quite a bit too, so I'll stop asking that question and let her pick up if she wants. But I'd, I'd like us to, and I know there's some resistance from the prosecutors and also from some judges. I brought it up at a criminal justice meeting and I almost had to have uh, security before I left. But anyway. I'd like to explore that further. Then the, um, on the law library, I wonder whether um, there isn't something we could do with, uh, particularly with all of the children using uh, tablets, <clears throat> if there isn't some way we could uh, allow prisoners, uh, you know, it would, to have tablets with very limited access uh, so they could continue to research their legal rights Absolutely. Uh, without going into the facility. I'd like to see us explore that. And maybe the Bar Association or somebody else might step up so we, um, this is not an immediate solution, okay. um, but we actually do have, uh, I will be selecting a vendor um, and it'll probably be come back before this board um, within the next couple of weeks, specifically for tablet devices that are designed to be used inside of correctional facilities. Great. Um, and they do have um, law library content um, in, in, in addition to a host of other benefits. All right. Um, we'll, when we bring that to you, Good. it's actually the benefits to those are are uh, quite um, robust, and right. so we'll I'll I'll do a short presentation on the highlights of all of the benefits that we'll get from implementing that resource. All right, and then I want to ask a, a question I've questioned all along, and I I guess I did like kind of kind of like an update on the ACA. You know, is it uh, what do we get out of that, and what do we pay, and uh, is it really, uh, is it effective? I don't need a, a comment today necessarily, but if you have something in the future you'd like to present or if you'd like to comment now. Um, and why don't you mention what I, the I, I can tell you that we, we pay the American Correctional Association 
once every three years for two audits, um, one for community corrections and one for the jail. Um, I believe this year, I'm gonna give you a ballpark, it was in front of the board a month or two ago. Um, 20,000, okay. um, I think, was the, the ballpark figure. Um, it, what, what compliance with any outside um, set of standards provides us is, is a check to make sure that we're keeping our eye on the ball in terms of our day-to-day -day operations. You know, we can do that ourselves anyway, but it's some, it, there is some benefit to having okay. somebody who doesn't see the same things you see every day uh, that right. you can start to, to maybe overlook um, to, uh, to provide that feedback. We also, just as a reminder, the, um, by being accredited by the American Correctional Association, we, there are some tangible benefits into the number of beds we have in the annex. Uh -huh. um, ACA's standards are, tend to be more updated and modernized compared to Nebraska jail standards. And as long as we're accredited by the American Correctional Association, we do not have to revert back to the American, or to the, uh, Nebraska jail standards, um, which create some issues for us in terms of housing in our annex. Okay. So there is a there is a very tangible benefit. Okay. Um, well, I think the charge sounds pretty reasonable. I thought it was a lot higher for some reason. I wanted to ask uh, if I could move. This is one that I think we've talked about. I know we have talked about on various times, but uh, you know, I uh, years ago when uh, and people know this, but anyway, I always like to bring it up because it worked. Uh, <laughs> I talked to the police officers about going to a 424252 work schedule so that even the lowly officer on the street gets a weekend off every every right. every few while, every while. And I, I really think we ought to be looking at this uh, in some of our facilities and, and particularly uh, this one. Uh, and I, we have to work with the unions to give it a try and uh, see what works. But I sure would like to try that. But now they're on, I think the police are on a straight 4-2 four, four shift where they work four days off to four days off to uh, all the way through, which which really is pretty helpful. Helps, I think it helps with the morale and helps get people out of out of the job. And anyway, let's look into that further. Um, then um, uh, we can talk about that another time and get something moving. Finally, I wanted to ask about when uh, all these people were brought in. The demonstrators were brought in a couple a month ago or whenever. Um, I assume we charge the city for all of that activity. Yes, I I was informed after we spoke about it at the last board of corrections meeting that. Um, at least the vast majority of individuals who were booked in on that day were booked in under city ordinance violations. Okay. So the city did get a bill uh, okay. for that. Thanks a lot, Mike. And keep it up. You're doing. I, I did talk to Mike about this. I know the red light's flashing, but I talked to Mike uh, on the phone the other, other uh, evening about the possibility of uh, putting together, and I've got some campaign funds that I'd be willing to contribute, putting together some kind of a nice food buffet of uh, maybe going to somebody like Orsi's and some other places and getting some food and some fresh fruit and uh, for a 24 hour thing in their, one of their rooms so people can come in and have some fresh food, give them some notice of it so they don't bring lunch and everything and let them know that we care about them, we're aware of them and, and what's happening. I really think that would help the morale. I'm, I'll send you all an email and see if you can contribute and what you can do so it's not government funds being used. And finally, I do wanna mention, of course, we had a one of our employees who was injured, and uh, I want to mention just that it was an employee who was attacked and has a, apparently has a broken jaw, and there was another uh, officer who got into the mix and tried to defend him and get the uh, perpetrator off, and uh, he has some problems with the hand. So I just want to let those people know that, uh, and I've talked to Mike about it, let them know that we're aware of the injuries, we are uh, on their side, and we uh, you know, really hope they heal very quickly. They're good people. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I would uh, endorse uh, Commissioner Boyle's idea about uh, sending some assistance to our brave uh, correction officers. And, and on top of that, I think that we should entertain uh, augmenting them uh, with uh, a real um, demonstration, which is hazardous duty pay for the COVID exposure that they've all experienced, as you recommended. Uh, I think some uh, things on COVID, but you know, they're on the front lines of that. And when you had that huge outbreak, um, it takes its toll. We've had this at the health center too. I think that all of our people uh, that have been on the front lines of battling COVID have been uh, put in 
harm's way and deserve uh, hazardous duty pay that we could easily uh, compensate them for out of our CARES thing. So I think sheriff's deputies, uh, corrections officers, uh, health uh, uh, personnel all deserve that. And that, I think, on top of uh, Senator, uh, Commissioner Boyle's idea of sending them a buffet is a real demonstration that uh, we care about uh, the hazards that they've faced on our behalf. I have a few questions for you. Thanks for this. Um, and, you know, the reports just seem to get better and better. I just have a couple of style points because no problem. Um, it's difficult for me to pull out some information sometimes. But um, on the uh, racial trend, page 42, um, if you could uh, include with that actual percentages of population. I had to go through and pull off the graph and ballpark it as much as I could. But from what I could see, um, the um, minority population of the correction center is uh, almost 70%. Uh, and it would be easier if you just right. applied those numbers. The actual percentages are obviously available because you've got the, the graph there, uh, so that we could see at a glance what's the population. And, and that would require combining the male and female population. I understand the breakout and I appreciate it. But if there could be, you know, an overall, there's 45% African Americans, which it appears there are, and almost 15% Hispanics, which it appears that there are, and Native Americans are another 4%, and others are another 3%. If we could have that at a glance, kind of as a summary, that would be helpful. Uh, but thanks, uh, this is a, a great report. Um, the overtime on page eight, um, which is understandable with the COVID outbreak that you've dealt with, that there would be uh, some overtime expenditures. Um, and uh, it looks like um, the um, expenditures over time were coming down and then you experienced this outbreak and obviously you were missing a lot of people and you had to put people into overtime. Is that That's correct? correct? Yeah. Uh, because on page seven, when you do the personnel, um, the authorized versus on hand, it looks like you were making really good progress uh, up until the onset of COVID and then it's just kind of plateaued. Uh, is is yeah. that you know there's connected? I, um, it to an extent, yes. We've had a there. We have had a handful of staff who have um, underlying health conditions who their physicians recommended that they probably need to find a different line of okay. work or to retire. And some of those things have happened. Right. Um, we have also had, um, like I said, the impact of shift bidding seems to impact us um, in the aftermath of that. Okay. Um, and. And, and there's just a, a variety of reasons, you know, um, some have left to go on to college and, you know, pursue sure. other opportunities. Um, there's not, I think the COVID has exacerbated it um, and brought it higher than what we would expect, um, but it's not all attributed to COVID. Gotcha. The uh, population on page 35, um, you know, I, I, I gotta say it, it appears to be uh, uh, fairly stable. I would just point out, it's a little difficult to read. I think there was a yeah. typo or something in, in setting this up so that numbers are overlaid with numbers. Uh, I, I can kind of make it out, but it's, again, just kind of a, a style point. But um, I think that's a good thing in light of everything that our populations, you know, kind of plateaued a little bit. Uh, I, I, I see that in relation to your authorized staff and, um, you know, considering that uh, you are authorized at 476 and you're at 439, you're, you know, really stretching it to, to get the, the job done. And then on top of that, with the COVID absences, uh, I see that there's um, a, a CARES uh, Act airflow cost uh, that you are installing. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, do you recall the exact cost of that CARES Act airflow? Um, there's a couple of different aspects to that. I would probably, I would rather defer to public properties to, to give you the exact cost on that. Okay. We will do that. 
Um, this is a really good report, and all in all, considering the tough times that we're in, uh, you're doing a super job uh, with a, a remarkably uh, resilient staff. So Absolutely. kudos to you and the, the people that work there. Um, the um, report, I, like I said, just keeps getting better and better. These little tweaks are not meant to mm -hmm. be anything other than constructive observations. So thanks for this. Thank you. Thank you. Further comments or questions for Mr. Meyer? All right. Then thank you, Mike. Thank you. Good report. Thank you. We do not have need of executive session that I'm aware of for the Board of Corrections, and we are at the end of the agenda. I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And I will declare it adjourned. We will now convene as the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. Could we please have the roll call, Mr. Ash? Commissioner Borgeson? Present. Commissioner Boyle? Present. Commissioner Cavanaugh? Yes. Commissioner Kraft is present virtually but cannot vote. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Rogers? Yes. Mr. Chair? Present. Thank you. Item 1A is the approval of the minutes from September 1, and 1, 1B is approval of claims submitted for payment through September 15th. What is the no, pleasure no. of the board? Second. Motion by Commissioner Morgan, seconded by Commissioner Boyle to approve items 1, A, and B. Questions or comments? Then I would call for the vote. Motion passes 6 to 0. Thank you. This brings us to the consent agenda, a fairly long. We have items A through O. There are two changes. I would late, like to make to the consent agenda uh, before we consider action. On item A, the very first one under Mr. Doyle's things, the last one in there, item eight, uh, should be on next week's agenda. I would like to strike that from this week's agenda. And then there is a correction in item G3 where it says uh, DR Anderson is to provide renovation. It should be of the Douglas County Health Department, not Health Center, Epidemiology Office. What's the item? G3 should say Health Department, not Health Center. Got it. What is the pleasure of the board? Second. Motion by Commissioner Rogers, seconded by Commissioner Morgan to approve the consent agenda with those changes. Questions or comments to anything on the consent agenda? Commissioner Kavanaugh. Um, just as a point of clarification, on item N, uh, under number one, it says contract claim for Alexandra A. Johnson and ROP8. Is that FOP8? Or is that oh, yes, it should be FOP. Okay. So I guess that's another correction All to right. the All right. Um, the um, item J, resolution approved, approving the schedule of funds transferred for the 2020-2021 uh, fiscal year, budgeted $16 million. Uh, Mr. Lorenz, just for the public's edification, if you could uh, tell folks what's going on, that's a significant amount of money. Joe Lorenz, Douglas County Finance Director. Um, this is just a list of the transfers that are contained in the budget that was approved. And uh, these go, these are funds that are transferred primarily from the inheritance tax fund to uh, different operating uh, divisions uh, with, within the county. So it goes to Veterans Health Service, CMHC, uh, corrections uh, and among others but we basically the great the lion's share is coming from inheritance tax and that's where we use inheritance tax uh, basically to supplement and and fund uh, other operations within the county and that's yes. I think several times I've I mentioned how important inheritance tax is to our financial well-being and as you can see that 14 million dollars is going from the inheritance tax into these different 
operations of the county. So, so that's the lion's share. And then there's some other ones regarding uh, 911 communications that come from uh, their different funds. They have two different funds, a wired fund and a wireless fund. Um, but uh, this is, we do this every year. And uh, if you have any specific questions, I'd be glad to, to answer them. Just one, uh, the inheritance tax fluctuates and we have no control over that. Um, have you seen a fluctuation up or down in It's, year? you know, it's kind of the law of large numbers that we have been targeting that in kind of anywhere from 12 to $14 million, and it's been pretty consistently in that range in Douglas County. No real fluctuation this year? Okay. Not, not, not. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you. Uh, I assume the maker, maker and seconder of the motion are okay with changing that letter from yeah. the FOP, that additional correction. Further questions or comments to anything on the consent agenda? If not, I would call for the vote. Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Next on the agenda, I'm gonna take my mask off for this one. This is gonna be within six feet. Uh, if, persons, if, if, if whoever is here, if you would come down for this, I would, I would appreciate it. While I read a resolution to a old friend. Resolved, whereas Mr. Chuck Sigerson was a longtime political leader in the state of Nebraska who was motivated to help others, and whereas he led the Nebraska Republican Party from 1995 until 2001, and whereas Mr. Sigerson was elected to the Omaha City Council in 2001 and served three terms as a councilman before health problems forced him to resign in 2010, and whereas Mr. Sigerson was credited for being a change agent in the community and having a passion for service, and whereas he loved the city of Omaha, the state of Nebraska, and his family. And whereas Mr. Sigerson died September 6, 2020 at the age of 75 after a decade-long battle with heart issues. And whereas Mr. Sigerson is survived by his wife, Elizabeth, son, Andrew, and daughter, Anthea. Now therefore be it resolved by this Board of County Commissioners that we hereby honor the life of Mr. Chuck Sigerson and recognize his longtime commitment to public service. Dated this date. Second. Commissioner Borgeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you both for being here today. Um, we just felt it was important to recognize Chuck um, for all that he's done um, for Douglas County, the city of Omaha, and the state of Nebraska. He really was a a pillar during his time of service, uh, public service, and we appreciate um, so much and wanted you all to know um, how much we appreciated him. You know, I do remember, um, and Commissioner Boyle, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but I actually remember when he was chair of the Republican Party and um, Commissioner Boyle's wife, Ann, was the chair of the uh, Democratic <laughs> Party. And, but I, I, one of the things that impressed me was there could be civil discourse respectfully. Yes. Yes. And they made sure of that. Mm -hmm. And we need so much of that more today than what we have. We need to go back and kind of bring back what that was when Chuck and Ann were at the helms yeah. because they did a fantastic job. And he carried that through during his time on the city council um, you can disagree, but it was a respectful disagreement, and you could put the papers down of what you were working on and go to the next one um, and still maintain that courtesy and respect. And that's what I really admired a lot, um, and it was, he was easy to work with. Um, and again, he, he will be missed, but I wanted to make sure that we were able to recognize him and thank you for giving him to us for all those years of public service. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. Well, it's uh, it's always uh, you can tell I can tell when uh, there's uh, genuine uh, support and interest in 
in doing something on the county board, and that was there was a scramble to get a resolution <laughs> on quickly, and I received notice that it's always in the mill and all that. So, uh, and that's always that's a great, great sign, and it's absolutely a very subtle tribute to uh, your dad and to your husband. Uh, and uh, to Anne enjoyed so much uh, uh, work, working with him, and I remember. Um, you know, she was up in Norfolk with Chuck, and they were speaking to a real, very, very Republican group, you know. And of course, there was somebody by the name of Lewinsky who had kind of messed up the presidential office a little bit. And there's my, my white-haired wife, and uh, uh, you know, not exactly in favor of all that activity, and uh, she's up there and has to defend this. And of course, Chuck is just, you know, you know giving her <laughs> all that kind of stuff, which is was was his way. It was wonderful. And I mean, it was so much fun to watch that. and. And then you'd see them off at the side talking seriously about some things, you know, and uh, and just having a very good conversation because they were good friends, bottom line. And but Anne had a way with Chuck uh, that was so much fun to watch, and it was almost like, um, you know, all in the family on that television show where Archie would say something. Not that he, not that Chuck was Archie, but that then <laughs> how Edith would react, you know. And so uh, Chuck one time made some comment that, you know, Anne was going to come after, and it was a pretty broad cut at the Democratic Party or whatever it was. And and so Ann, Ann just said, looked at him, she says, oh, Chuck. And he started laughing, which, of course, blows the whole premise because he's up there <laughs> laughing then, you know. So, But that was his disposition. And uh, I had business before the city council, and I'd appear at that podium. And uh, we had some things, and I got some things passed for some clients and so forth, nothing big. But uh, as I was leaving, uh, Chuck said, be sure you tell Ann how I voted. <laughs> <laughs> I voted for your for your plan, Boyle. You know, but he was a great, just a great guy, and I always enjoyed his company as well. I mean, he was just a, a good good man. And uh, Marianne hit the nail on the head. That's what uh, we need. We're just dying from uh, the lack of civility and and being yeah, able to, yeah. you know. Uh, and the county board here is really interesting. There's four Democrats, three Republicans, and we vote unanimously on important issues and. We don't get into party politics. It just doesn't belong in this kind of, you know. Ann always said you were elected on a party label. Her father said this. And once you get there, you serve the people. You don't serve the party. And um, that was Chuck, and that was Ann. And I have a feeling they're going at it. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, he was a great guy to work with. And uh, I just can't say enough about him. I loved him dearly and uh, just a class, class guy. So Thank you. Segerson name is a very good name for me to remember. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. I, I would say that Chuck truly epitomized the passion and statesmanship yeah. that we should all be striving for. That's right. OK, uh, further questions or comments? Then could we please go? Uh, and Liz, I mean, yeah. you're, you're welcome to respond if you have any any comments you'd like to make well i would like to thank you very much for doing this i mean it's a great honor for us and, uh, give your mom the microphone terribly i mean oh. yeah i like to thank you very much for doing this i mean we'll miss him terribly but the last 11 years has been a difficult yeah. time for him of course and he's at peace now yeah nice. that's thank right you. thank you Liz. thank you thank you thank you andrew no i i would just I would concur that, uh, you know, when I was growing up, um, it was partisan, but it ended when we were done talking politics. And uh, the last, I don't know, several years, that's just not the way it is. And uh, we just appreciate you guys recognizing him with this today. Um, he loved this city and this oh, yeah. community. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You got a vote? Um, yeah. Motion passes six to zero, and I, I could take a photo if you guys want me to. That'd be That's, nice.
Whenever we do something that neat, I always just want to be done. Yeah. Just quit. <laughs> you know, hard, hard to, hard to top that. Next on the agenda, we have citizen comments. Would anybody care to address the board of commissioners on anything that is not on the agenda? This is your opportunity to do so. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan of Seven Seven Four Eight Western Avenue. Um, I just want to talk generally about COVID on here and how our public officials and health directors and others have addressed the issue. I know that information changes rapidly and it's easy to have this monopolize our thinking in health, but I have three concerns that I wish to address. Um, yes, masks can be helpful in certain situations on there. They're an aid or tool, but as a matter of public policy, there's a lot of collateral damage from it and not as much benefit as you think. First off, less than 1% of the population has active COVID infection. That means 99% of us wearing these masks in public have no infection we could spread even if we wanted to. So that means it really needs, depends on the situation, what you're dealing with. You have to know you're infected, you have to know someone's infected, you have to know that you're around people that are infected and so forth. On the flip side of it, and you look at the statistics on this, of the people that are actually getting ill, not all of us are being treated, no, not all of us are at the same risk. 75% of the people who've died in this county are ages 65 and older. That means there's a cofactor. There's another factor that's involved in getting sick with this virus. We're squandering our youth on right now. They are more danger at committing suicide than they are getting infected by COVID or getting sick and dying from it. The second point I wish to make, make a point of is We've got so panicked and let the fear run so quickly, we keep changing the goalpost. First, it was to level the curve, flatten the curve. Well, now our hospitals are fine, that we can handle it, we're doing fine. But we're told, oh, we need to bring the positivity down to these tests. And I'm saying, all you're doing is extending the crisis. You're only forcing people to stay home. I mean, if, if I'm told, geez, we have to wear masks, geez, maybe I won't go out. And it's causing sociological and uh, psycho psychological damage. I got neighbors that have not been out since March. And the third part I wish to make is I really wish we had health people, medical professionals, that were doing the scientific inquiry because here's one piece of information that keeps being dropped out. The people getting sick with COVID-19 have substantial vitamin D deficiencies. Vitamin D is a very peculiar vitamin. You don't get most of it from diet. You get it from the sun, and the sun is temporal. As days get shorter, the nights get longer, we will all have vitamin D deficiency unless we're taking something that has supplements or is actually fortified with vitamin D. That's something we need to consider. But I've heard no advocacy from the public health community on that fact. And those are the type of things that we need to be looking at. Um, if we continue to make this an unending crisis, we're going to lose our cities. There's no reason for me to go out in Omaha. My friends don't go out. Most of my or social organizations haven't met since March. So what am I supposed to do? Why stay in the city? I may as well just go out and farm and retire. So I really wish that we take, think about that comprehensively and regarding public health. We think that the virus is the worst thing in the world. It's going to turn out it's not just a respiratory disease that we just have to deal with. Historically speaking, for those that are looking forward to a vaccine and think that's gonna solve it, I have news for you. We don't have very good vaccines for respiratory diseases. And it's true of the flu vaccine. If you ask your doctor about it, they can tell you. And that's the fact. So we have to look at all the factors involved of how we deal with public health. It's screaming, scaring, putting all your eggs in one basket and assuming, well, the masks are the golden ticket. No, they're just a tool. 
and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Andrew. And we aren't supposed to respond, although retiring and farming aren't necessarily the same thing. I would, <laughs> as a farmer, I would have to make that point. So. Uh, others, this is the opportunity to speak. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. John Els, a retired uh, university professor and nonprofit executive. <coughs> I'm sorry, John, I missed your last name. Else, Thank like you. anything else. Okay, <laughs> very good. Thank you, sir. I'm 81 years old, though most people don't recognize that, even my doctors and nurses. <laughs> nice. Uh, I started my career in the civil rights movement in Mississippi in 1963 to 65. Then I came to Omaha in 66. First worked for the uh, DC, the Douglas County Welfare Department, which is an exciting time to be there. Uh, and then joined the GOCA staff to create the Greater Omaha Community Action, the first anti-poverty program in Omaha. <clears throat> and then joined UNO and provided leadership under the provost, uh, Gaines, uh, in the design and development of the College of Public Affairs and Community Service, and, uh, and bringing the School of Social Work from Lincoln to Omaha, which was no easy task. Then I moved to Iowa, and during that time I spent three years in Southern Africa, Zambia and Zimbabwe, training nonprofit leaders from many African countries. After return from Iowa, I resigned from the University of Iowa. Uh, to, from Africa, I res retired from, resigned from the University of Iowa and created a statewide nonprofit uh, business development and loan program for welfare recipients and other low income populations. I'm, I'm just, Iowa and Nebraska, which state? Iowa. Thank you. In Iowa. Okay. Uh, it was part of a, a six state demonstration program nationally. And we were one of the outstanding performers in that, had over 50% success rate after five years with small businesses. Uh, then uh, I, re I retired in 2005, so 15 years ago. And after my wife's retirement from the International Reading Association in 2009, we moved to Omaha, where our children and grandchildren are. In 2018, I began to, as a volunteer consultant with New Life Family Alliance, New Life Family Alliance, NL, NLFA, uh, <clears throat> which is the only multi-tribal uh, South Sudanese organization in Omaha. Uh, Omaha has the largest South Sudanese population mm -hmm. outside of South Sudan. It is the world capital uh, of S South Sudanese. It has 15 to 20,000 people, wow. the largest refugee population in Omaha, and another 10 to 15,000 in Nebraska. <coughs> in, in, in 2011, most of us weren't aware of that, Omaha was the U.S. center for refugee uh, voting for in its independence election. And that won by 99%, both in South Sudan and in the United States. Uh, so South Sudan became independent in 2011. Many Omaha South Sudanese people returned who were well-educated and trained and wanted to help South Sudanese be develop. But within, after two years, uh, civil war started in South Sudan. Uh, and I should say, South Sudan is an almost entirely Christian country. Uh, it was at war for 30 years with uh, the northern part of the country, uh, which is entirely Muslim. Uh, the uh, that civil war broke out in 2013. Most of the Omaha uh, South Sudanese returned uh, because of the conflict there. And uh, though that civil war continues, though there's been a lot of progress toward peace. Uh, the South Sudanese, most South Sudanese parents in Omaha, and they've been here 15 to 20 years, uh, 
grew up in rural parts of the country where there were no schools. Sorry, they can't read or write their own language. And they're afraid to try English. We've tried hard to get ESL classes uh, and we get some people in it, but they're resistant. They cannot respond to English requests for additional information as they make application. They don't understand the applications and they can't make responses to requests for other information by email or uh, phone because they don't understand or they're not able to verbalize the response. We made 20 applications for rental assistance in the first two weeks. And that was five or six weeks ago. One of those 20 was accepted. The other were rejected because of insufficient information. Uh, you had to have a signed lease. Most of the people who lived in these apartments 10 or 15 years, they didn't have those leases anymore. So they, they had to request those from the landlord, and the landlord was furious. But they had to provide those again. Uh, we tried communicating with a human being, and it took us weeks to get a telephone number for your online application. And we finally got one, and that woman has been fantastic. Her name's Tiffany, and she works for your Douglas County General Assistance. Okay. Uh, she's helped us get approval for our person. We have a full-time staff person now who speaks, who's been educated in the United States with master, bachelor's and master's and speaks Arabic, Dinka, and Nuer, and he can speak with most of the South Sudanese population. The board of directors of New Life Family Alliance is, represents 10 or 12 different tribes, and so it's the only one that brings people together. <coughs> and for, on the whole, they're educated people, many educated here in the United States, as Gatoy Diang is. <coughs> And, uh, but we've had an unbelievable pro uh, problem applying for rental assistance, as I said. Uh, and once we contacted uh, Tiffany, she's been just wonderful, helping us uh, al allow our communicator to be the communicator between that office and the clients, which was before was not allowed. They had to have the client's name and that phone number. And so they had to try to communicate with them, which was impossible. <coughs> However, uh, as we started resubmitting applications through her, and she clarified things for us, she saw three, at least three of the first applications we got were for mortgages, not for rents. These were habitat houses whose loans were handled by local banks and whose mortgage rates are lower than most rental rates. And she couldn't handle them. I'm sorry. Uh, I've talked with uh, several, uh, uh, at least two of your county commissioners last week uh, and complained that mortgages weren't uh, provided. And uh, one noted that uh, they were excluded because some mortgage or have multiple funding sources and that would make the situation management difficulty. Di management difficult. Uh, <coughs> others also noted various other services that uh, where we could find assistance for, mortgage, uh, for mortgages. Uh, I've called several of those and haven't had a response from a single one. Not from a single one. 
Uh, so I want to recommend to you that you change your policy and include mortgages in your rental assistance, in rental and mortgages. And if you need to put a, a, a limitation on it because of multiple funding sources, then put it on. Say we'll, we'll fund mortgages where there's one lender, one mortgage source. That's okay. You don't have to fund all mortgages. You can put a limitation on it. That's legal. I used to teach social policy, incidentally. Uh, finally, let me say that utility assistance has been even more difficult. We got names of six different agencies or more. Only one of those has been responsive to this, and that's Heart Ministries in North, o North Omaha. I've had six conversations with Salvation Army, personal conversations, friendly conversations, and they have not been able to make a single change that makes it more accommodating for us to serve non-English speaking people. Uh, <coughs> we've, we had no response from together. The DHH office up in North 24th has given us no positive responses. Dollar energy process is so difficult, complex, that it's virtually impossible to use. People are desperate. They have had threats of their turn off of their utilities. One, we got extended for two or three times before on the last day, Heart Ministry came through with a fund for it. So I, I just want to say we need your help. Thank you, Dr. Appreciate your Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Appreciate you bringing those things to our attention, sir. Would Mr. anybody Chair? else? Commissioner Boyer. Well, uh, I, I I thought that uh, mortgages, and I told Doctor that I thought they were that was part of the uh, relief that we could get. But and Joe said no and that stuff. But I did find out that um, uh, Matthew Cavanaugh uh, is with the uh, Nebraska Housing Developers Association, and uh, apparently they can offer some help. And I'll try to get that information to you. I don't have an address or a phone number, but I'll get something to you, Doctor. And uh, I just came across your your phone call it was at four o'clock on on the ninth and i didn't see it until this morning i'm not really sure why but i i'll check it out uh, i could blame my new secretary but it's probably my fault <laughs> thank you i'm smiling <laughs> thank you and thank you for your advocacy it's very important you obviously are very committed and uh that i congratulate you that's very wonderful to hear that kind of commitment come through thank you doctor very much would anybody else like to share in their citizen capital? Claire, I have. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Capital. Uh, thank you, Doctor. This is an uh, eloquent uh, testimony. I would uh, share with you some information on a hearing that we're having on exactly this topic on Thursday, and I'll give this to you before you leave here today, um, with the Health and Human Services Committee relative to the requirements. Uh, we have struggled with this to get this out to as many people as possible, and some of the points you bring up are exactly points that we're talking about and we'll be talking about on Thursday. You can zoom into these meetings. Um, the gentleman that uh, Commissioner Boyle mentioned, Matthew Cavanaugh, is actually my nephew. If you want to follow up with me, I could probably put you in uh, touch with them. And I think representatives of Together are here today, and so maybe before you leave, uh, you could uh, meet with them briefly and, and see. But thanks for bringing this up. I mean, this is exactly the kind of feedback that we need to improve the assistance that we're trying to get out to people. Uh, and it's a two-way street. So we appreciate your, your constructive uh, criticism, and we're going to respond to it. I would hope that you'd participate in this process going forward and maybe join us on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. The microphone is open for citizen comments. Larry Storr, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska, 68132. Good morning. Morning. Uh, yes, thank you, doctor. But I, I, I want to revise and extend my remarks from a couple of weeks ago first in regards to a man I met outside on the patio <clears throat> before a meeting. He was sitting around waiting for services from this building. 
I don't know all the facts, but he supposedly was a homeless vet. I spent the whole day with him. I took him around to different things. I told you about that. What I'm a little upset about is the follow through by all of the agencies in this county and city that I pay for with my billfold and how it let people down. He was waiting, he had already talked to somebody, I verified this, in human relations, the city of Omaha that was going to get him a ticket home. But over the course of four or five days, he's probably thrown out of two or three different homeless shelters, slept overnight in the bushes not far down from the Salvation Army. <clears throat> After I'd spent a couple of days, maybe six, seven hours each day, Still, he didn't get any help. I even knocked on the Salvation Army door myself, two different places. I called 911, told them what I was doing. But they didn't want to talk when they did show up, so I don't know whether they were showing up because somebody wanted him arrested or what. But that night, he had to sleep in the bushes just down the street because the police officers and the fire rescue units talked to him for a couple of minutes and drove off. I suppose they didn't have room for all of his personal belongings that were also carted there by one of our temporary shelter community partners. Well, a couple of days later, I find out from an employee of the Human Relations Department, I guess I should not use his name, but I do want to thank him but I want to say also that of all of those you people and all of the city council people, all of the employees and all of the partners in Omaha, community partners, that spend my money dropped the ball here. It's tomorrow maybe that he's back on his way back here to go to Lincoln for something. What I'm pointing out here is he didn't get the help that he was supposed to get. I even called the VA. Nobody responded. When he finally got a hold of this city employee in the Human Relations Department, there was more than one actually, that person had to spend six hours of his day, and I'm not sure that that wasn't on a Sunday, and out of his own pocket, a bus ticket back home because Omaha didn't help him. Enough on that, but I do thank him and their department, but I wonder why it was so slow in coming about. <clears throat> Next, I wanna say, I don't think I ever got five minutes of green light that presentations that went on here this morning seemed like they went on a long time. I don't think I talked that long, but sometimes I lose the green light. The next point is, uh, I sent an email to both bodies yesterday. I want that included in my comments. But I also want these two items included, which are from the... Uh... That's all I have. They're from the Alternative Press in Omaha. I get a lot of my information out of there because the Omaha World Herald doesn't cover it. And then the next last item, uh, although I agree with Mr. Cavanaugh and the gentleman, that, uh, the doctor that just left, I'm not a professor. But should not that have been a presentation rather than a citizen comment? I'm sorry, don't cut me off. I, could prob I should probably get as much time as he had, but I won't take it. But right there on your, your rules on the front page of this document that you hand out, says you will, as a result, you will not respond. But you did. And he, had, he went through the yellow light and for quite a long while on the red light. I won't do that. But it's not me that's out of order now. It was you. Thank you. I'm sorry I let Dr. Ells speak past five minutes. It seemed like he had a lot of important things to say there. Anybody else wishing to address this group under citizen comments?
Luis Jimenez, 3306 Bird Street. There's a few things that I want to talk about, um, so I'll do it as quickly as I can. I've, I've got pictures here of barricades that are have been placed on the um, uh, on the site around here, and I don't bring this up. Um, I, I do it because there was rumors going on yesterday about what th these were, and I th I was disappointed. Um, I th I, th I think that it could have been cleared, er, uh, because it was tied. The brew some of the rumor was that they were putting this out in anticipation of social civil unrest, even though that's probably not the case. So I, I, I don't know who decided to do this. It was probably the building commission. Um, they're placed around and by the courthouse. Th th this is the one that I think mo most people were looking at uh, because of um, the possibility that the grand jury for the death of James Scurlock is going to be announced soon. Um, it's just better information sharing, I think, that the county and, oh, well, this, this place here um, really needs to uh, put more effort into it and see the efficacy of what they're doing. I, I think the website is, is good. You know, I can't complain much about the website. Um, but when something like this happens, and I came here yesterday and asked questions, and the officers gave me some, some answers. Anyway, there's an article on noise on it. Um, have a read. Um, also, while I have time, uh, last, last time I was here, Commissioner Boyle said that the commissioners were for mental health, and this uh, city council was for jobs. I don't know where he got that from, I hope that uh, you clarify that because I think it was off the cuff comment just to get something through. Um, but I don't think that's grounded in anything that's mandated um, specifically by law that the county has to focus on mental health and this while the city focuses on jobs. I can't say that either of those things are done well here. Um, so there's, there's uh, that too. So that, that was very disappointing, Mr. Boyle. Um, also, uh, there's... Back off. Is the mic. The, I, I'll give you opportunity. Okay, I'll, I'll let him finish, Luis finish. Oh, okay, yeah, and I was gonna say, if you need to come over here, you, you can. Then uh, later today at the city council, there's um, gonna down? be a, a presentation by Ben Gray I believe, as, as I've been told. Why don't you put it on the slide so we can see it? Oh, okay. There's, there's going to be a march okay. regarding yeah, Ed Point Dexter, okay. 24th and Evans. And I'm not going to say much about that. I think Ben Gray is going to comment, Council Member Ben Gray, later today. But I, for me, it, it just seems uh, like something that happens, something old and something new. There was earlier in the summer, there was social unrest. And then now there's this refocus um, on this incarcerated individual. However, I think Preston Love Jr. was talking um, to corrections, Nebraska, uh, not corrections, um, the pardons board back in January. So he's been doing some leg work and I really appreciate what he does. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, you. Luis. Commissioner Boyle. Yeah, I do wanna clarify what I meant. Uh, in uh, the city and the county governments are quite different. Uh, the, uh, the city has a legislative power. I'm sure you've noticed that. We don't. I mean, I think we have a couple of things we can pass laws on. One of them is uh, truckers uh, downloading or whatever you call it with their Break, Jake breaking, driving down the street and making a lot of noise. Only that's, on interstates, because that's what the legislature specified. Yeah. Only on interstates. Only on the interstates. So, I mean, we, we, have, we can't do a mask. 
uh, ordinance. We don't have authority to do any ordinance. We can't pass anything. The city can. So what I was trying to communicate was that uh, there are divisions and responsibilities in Douglas County, and county government is responsible for delivering uh, services directly to people, like, you know, we do the uh, assessment of property, we do uh, registered deeds, we license cars, we do dr all this sort of thing. And one of the things that we do is uh, mental health. And we have a full-blown mental health facility over at 42nd and, and Woolworth. And uh, Sherry Glassnap is the director of it. And we have people in and out. And I've taken people there who've needed help. And uh, that's the spot where they get a lot of mental health uh, services from Douglas County. The city does not operate that kind of facility. The county does. And the county does not do a jobs program. We don't have a jobs program. The city does. And they have, and I think they're doing really well on it. They've got, you know, they've got a lot of responsibilities. They're trying to get a lot of people employed. But the city does the jobs, and we don't. And we do the primary, the mental health uh, work, and the city does not. So that's what I was trying to communicate. And uh, I was listening to uh, Council Member Jerem talk about what he wanted to do. And as it turned out, uh, with Commissioner Borgerson leading the way, we were able to put $2 million of the CARES funds into mental health operations. And I'm very happy about it. And of course, UNMC is plunging ahead uh, wonderfully with the uh, facility they're opening at 42nd and Davenport, I believe it is, for uh, or Douglas maybe, 42nd and Douglas. And uh, it's uh, gonna be a great facility. They had a wonderful presentation. I called the uh, uh, fellow who does the uh, lobbying or whatever you call it for the UNMC and UNO, and they're gonna present that to the city council as well, just so they know what's going on. But it's a wonderful two million. mental health operation. So you present the two million to the city council? I'm sorry, what? They're, they're going to present the $2 million to the no, city council? No, not the $2 million. The, the, the UNMC is developing an uh, emergency psychiatric no. unit. So when someone comes in who's having a, they don't go to the ER, they go yeah, to this good. other facility. And it's really a very progressive. Commissioner Borgerson again saw this up in Oregon uh, and uh, brought it back to us. And so anyhow, we have divisions of, of authority, so there's not duplication is what I was saying. I'm sorry I didn't okay. say it clearly. Okay. Does and keep up sense? the good work. I'll try not to run you over next time when I yell your name and you're in the street. Okay, yeah. The All cop right, was please. right behind you. Okay, you pal. You've been caught. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Would anybody else wish to address this group under citizen comments? Okay. Then we will move on to the presentations and the CARES Act update. Uh, the first item is a resolution allocating $3,581,948.50 in CARES Act funding to the Building Commission for COVID-19 related capital improvement expenses. What is the pleasure of the board? I make a motion to approve. I don't know if I have a conflict, but I'll make a motion to approve. You have no conflict and I will second okay. your motion. Uh, questions or comments? Mr. Cohen is here, if anybody has. I would just say that these are necessary improvements that need to be made to make the building more effective and to protect the public uh, and uh, the employees as well from the wrath of COVID. So I would, I'm very much in, in support of this. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Yes. Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Um, this is an example of uh, overtime and over budget on the $120 million uh, <coughs> program that the private corporation is running for the building commission across the street. We have a request here for, I think, 3.3 million to replace uh, air and uh, other uh, HVAC uh, apps in the MUD headquarters building, which was part of the $120 million scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're putting money into that, which was not part of the um, bond issue issued by the um, building commission. And so. This is just another example of the cost overruns that we're already experiencing on this uh, project uh, that the people didn't get to vote on. Um, I would ask if um, Mr. Cohen uh, could step down for a second, a couple of questions. Paul Cohen, Omaha Douglas Public Building Commission Administrator. Yes, sir. Thanks for joining us this morning. I uh, appreciate it. Um, so this building across the street, the old MUD headquarters, is the site that the $3.3 million is uh, proposed to go to. Is that right? That's correct. OK. And could you tell us just briefly what that $3.3 million is supposed to do on that property? Sure. 
when when uh, we purchased the property and uh, and began to look at it for use as was now proposed to be the uh, the home of the probation department uh, for the state um, it was fine until COVID came along and then as the owners of the building we went to the owner's rep and said we want the heating and air conditioning the HVAC system in that building to meet the same standards that we've applied in the buildings that we currently own and operate okay if I could just stop you there for a second so the standards that you're talking about those standards that are you know COVID compliant are in effect in this building and in the Hall of Justice currently they're currently in the hall and they will be when you approve this total motion we have an additional 211,000 as part of this total that will add the necessary UV lighting to the HVAC in these in this complex mm -hmm. and all we ask with this project is to do the same thing there that pre COVID was not part of the project was never part of the budget was never part of the conversation until COVID that's why we've asked for it as part of the CARES Act. Commitment. Right. But it's 200 and some thousand to do that here in a much bigger building than the MUD headquarters where it's 3.3 million. Right. That's because the, the current HVAC system in the MUD building is not large enough or capable of providing the air exchange, the filtration, or the UV lighting that's needed. Our systems already were. The one in the Hall of Justice? Hall of Justice and the Civic Center and the connector buildings. Had they been recently upgraded to? In the hall, we just completed the project, as you're aware, the last project that you helped us work on over in the Hall of Justice was completed and we upgraded the HVAC at that time in the hall. Okay, and that was a pre-COVID project? Yes, sir. Okay, so these are in addition to the funds that we're already expending under the, the uh, bond issue, $120 million to purchase and refurbish that facility and the other facilities proposed for that yes, they are. campus, right? Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna have a difficult time supporting this. It's part and parcel of the bond issue which has been touted to us all along as on time and on budget and this is not. This is a, the latest of proposals and we've heard them in the private corporations board meetings to add floors and to increase costs. This building uh, thing that started off in the Chin report at $87 million is now heading north of the uh, bond issue that nobody got to vote on, which is supported by tax increase that we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, now we're taking more money than we are spending in occupied buildings like the Douglas County Youth Center, and we'll talk about that in a minute too, uh, occupied by our children uh, to upgrade the uh, HVAC system. So um, I'm not uh, in a position to vote for another profit source for the private corporation that's uh, running the scheme across the street. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. The, um, uh, I wanted to ask you, Paul, <clears throat> on some of the the other buildings, I mean, this one, this building we're in was not, uh, uh, of course, I, you weren't here when it was built, but uh, this wasn't built with the vote of the people, was it? Built no. by the Building Commission? No, it was not. The, oh, okay. um, the so I, and I, I probably should talk to Leahy about this, but some of the buildings that we use, uh, they're not rentals, but that we own, uh, you know, the Fitzgerald home, for example. Uh, if we're making changes out there, um, then to be consistent, um, you know, people who are opposed to what your what this subject is today right now they should also be opposed to improvements at the Fitzgerald home as well because those were not built with a vote of the people either and uh, uh, it's um, I'm not I've had serious questions about this whole facility and all the rest of it and I still do to be honest with you but uh, you know you, you got to face reality and, and we need to take care of people and be sure that they're safe so that's all I would say but uh, this is um, to be consistent, you need to vote, uh, those of who have objected to this proposal need to vote no on all the improvements, including the Douglas County Health Center where our aged people are living. You should vote no, you should have voted no on that. And uh, because that wasn't built with a public a vote of the people either. So, and there are people living there and so we're trying to improve the air and make it safe. 
So if you're opposed to making the air safe and all that sort of thing in buildings where we have the elderly living or where we have people incarcerated, go ahead and vote no. Just vote no. So uh, let's be consistent about it. I plan to vote yes. You know, I'm not, I'm not fully in favor of this, but I have to balance these things and make a, a fair decision on what ought to be done. And while I'm not a big fan of this facility, you know, I've talked to you a lot about this, uh, and I'm still edgy about it, but I have to vote yes to make these improvements. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Duda, may I speak? Commissioner Kraft? Yes. Yes. Yeah, every opportunity, Commissioner uh, um, Kavanaugh has, he has to overtalk this issue. He's a sore loser. That's all it is, is he's a sore loser. And he refuses to admit that he lost. He lost, and he doesn't understand the process. And he doesn't remember from week to week to week when we've discussed these things. I'm amazed at how much he does not remember. And I'm gonna repeat myself, because he does. I am amazed at how much Mr. Kavanaugh does not remember from the week before or two weeks before. It just astounds me. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kraft. Further questions or comments? Commissioner Kavanaugh. Thank you. Well, I, I'm afraid that my friend, uh, uh, Commissioner Boyle, might be conflating some things because what was done at 156 in Maple, what he calls the Fitzgerald Home, the West Campus, uh, was subject to a vote of the people, and he should remember that. Um, the, the other facilities that we have occupied by people under our care, like the Douglas County Health Center and the Douglas County Youth Center, are under our direct purview. This scheme across the street is run by a private corporation through the Building Commission. And I understand that you've had reservations about this, but your reservations always end when it comes to funding this scheme. And this is just the latest addition to a non-voter approved scheme to build something that is in part at least not necessary. It has nothing to do with the people under our care, the Douglas County Health Center, the Douglas County Youth Center, the Douglas County Correction Center. They're totally different things. This is something that was purchased along with the OHA building and I don't see any uh, appropriation of $3.3 million to upgrade the HVAC at the OHA building that was picked up and then forgotten as part of this uh, scheme. But this is just, you know, additional cost overruns to a project that was already a great profit source for the private corporation, the people associated with it that are running up our taxes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the tax question later on the agenda. Thank you. I, I, I'm and sorry, me. I, I'm, I'm going to respond first, Commissioner Kraft, if I may. The decision has been made. We bought the building. We're going to move probation into it. We just heard Mr. Myers saying how helpful probation has been to him in addressing some of his issues. We have a legal obligation to provide probation with space where they will be interviewing children, lots of people that aren't in there by choice. We have an opportunity with CARES Act funding to take a building with what was an adequate heating and ventilation system pre-pandemic. It is no longer safe. It is no longer adequate. Before we put people in it, we have an opportunity here to make it a safe building. I am sorry that politics rears its ugly head again when all we're trying to do is make a safe building for probation. Commissioner Kraft. Yes, and, and I heard the scheme, the word scheme, at least five times in that comments by Mr. Kavanaugh. I hate to repeat myself, but because he repeats himself so many times, it becomes obnoxious. And I think that's what he wants to be, is obnoxious. This is an add-on, an unforeseen, and it's not going to cause a cost overrun because it's not part of the initial cost and it's the CARES Act funding. And the scheme has been used by Lincoln, by the state of Nebraska, and by 
uh, UNM, uh, the university system, where you can, and, and oh, by the way, the federal government on the building of the uh, Veterans Administration add-on. <clears throat> that same scheme got them on time and mm -hmm. under budget. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I hate to repeat that word so many times, but uh, I think that's the only way that Mr. Kavanaugh can understand anything. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kraft. Further questions or comments to the motion before us? I have a comment okay. of comments. Luis Jimenez, 3306 Burt Street. Um, and you know what, Mr. Kraft, I want to respond quickly. It, if it's a scheme, it's, it's fine I'm calling it a scheme. It could be a good scheme or it could be a bad scheme. And what we're saying is this is a bad scheme. It's unfortunate that, that you still think that um, you guys were the only ones in the discussion and that um, the various uh, individuals in Douglas County that came out against this are, are forgotten. Well, hopefully they're not forgotten. They were out protesting. Some of them were last last week. That it, if that's how you think, Mr. Kraft, then it's good that your retirement is nearing. Um, here, here's some pictures of the of the individuals that were protesting. What were you protesting? The construction of juvenile detention downtown. Your project, the scheme. The, they're protesting that the, city, um, the county was using a nonprofit to get bonds instead of the vote of the people to issue the bonds. The, the, there's, there's been opposition every step of the way, and it seems like Mr. Kraft forgot. Could, could I ask that we bring this back to the topic of, of ventilation system for the MUD building, please? That's the, okay. the decision before us. Well, it's going to be part of the complex. It's not just being used to air the building. You know, yes, th it it's going to be housing the, uh, you know, legal services. The, the judges are going to have their own building. You, That's a different building. <laughs> okay. Well, if you, Mr. Duda, if you want to editorialize my comments, let, let, we, we can keep doing this. I would prefer if we could talk about the subject at hand. That's all I'm asking. Okay. The subject at hand is do we put the new CARES Act money into to a new heating and air conditioning system for the building that probation will soon be occupying? Okay. Well, um, to take precautions, it, it, it would make sense. However, um, people don't want the, that complex operating, especially when you add juvenile detention uh, to the mix. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I'm not done. I still have time. Please, uh, I am, I'm on minutes, right, with the green light? Nobody has cut you off. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I had some thoughts. I didn't write, write them down. Uh, the ventilation, great. Buy your equipment. Get your options going. It's going to get somebody rich. Anyway, <laughs> even with these new designs, somebody's getting rich off of this. Um, and that, that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Morgan. Space presently for probation. Am Correct. I correct? You are correct. Which I know the answer to it, but I want to make yep. sure that you correct me. Yep. Secondly, and I know we have Paul here and Jerry Leahy. If they uh, want to correct me, I'm appreciative of that. The second part of this is the plan is to move them into the MUD building because of the COVID virus. We are trying to make sure that we have a good air handling system in that building. And they brought to our attention that we should change that now before moving the probation office in there. And if I'm not correct, Jerry, I know you like to respect all commissioners. Don't <laughs> worry about correcting me or Paul Cohen, who's with the building commission. That's what we're talking about, period. We're not talking about some scheme or underlying whatever. We're talking about one item, if I'm correct again. Yet we have to get sidetracked, and I was appreciative that Commissioner Kavanaugh 
didn't use the word kitty gel again, which I've had the parents calling me about. And we do have a lot of support to have it downtown, as does St. Paul, Minneapolis, and other cities that I visited, Memphis, uh, and some others. So, uh, Jerry, you're welcome to correct me on that or whatever you want to say. Good morning, Jerry. Uh, <clears throat> Jerry Leahy, Public Property. Um, Commissioner Morgan, you're right on about the uh, lease <clears throat> for the probation office. It's about $16,000 a month. <clears throat> it's been a plan all along to put them uh, with the purchase of the uh, MED property and the 1723 building to put them into that building to eliminate that lease. I believe there are 80 officers that would be working in that building that are now in the Key Lime building. And to have another point of view about this whole discussion, if I may. Uh, I was involved, as you know, when we purchased the MED property, along with the 1723 building. And uh, Jeff McGill and a couple others that toured the 1723, we had concern <clears throat> of the HVAC system, but we were pretty much of the opinion that we could get another probably 15 years out of that existing system. So now what you have <clears throat> is a project with the courthouse tower, the annex, uh, with a brand new <clears throat> design, modernized HVAC system. You have a detention center with a new design, modern system. And you have 1723 with a, uh, in, in comparison, absurd compared to the other two. So the opportunity was there. Uh, it is CARES Act money. Uh, as you know, when I was here for Health Center, HVAC uh, request, talked a lot about ventilation. Since that time, I can't tell you how many times I've heard uh, and read articles on ventilation and COVID and CARES Act money to correct deficiencies. So that's my other point of view to try to clarify. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jerry. If that helps. Yeah, it does. I, I believe it does. Thank you. Larry Store, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. There was a phrase mentioned a little bit earlier about non voter approved. This whole CARES thing is pointing out one thing on a national basis. There's an awful lot of people and government bodies that are rushing in there to get money from the federal government, which is out of my pocket, for this and for that. This particular item is something that should have been voted on by the people of the county. Never had an opportunity. Probably won't get to. I don't know, couldn't hear everything he just said, but I think he referred to the 1700s or what. If, if he was talking about the revolution, the, the, the topic is a new air system. Excuse me, you didn't call system. him out of order, so don't call me out of order. I'm not calling you out of order. I'm asking you to stay on topic. My topic is on topic. When you go around the public, deny their votes, you are usurping the Constitution and your sworn duty. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other comments about a heating and air conditioning system for the 1723 building. Yes, I have one more for you. Uh, Mr. Your Cohen. final comment, Commissioner Cavanaugh. Yeah, just for Mr. Cohen, a quick question. <clears throat> uh, 
Dr. Paul Cohen. I'm on Douglas Public Building Commission. Thanks again for being here. Yes, sir. So when this property was originally acquired and the plan was to utilize it for now it's probation, but it was going to be utilized for some office. As a matter of fact, the purchase agreement says we got to use it for 50 years in its current form. Wasn't there a plan to refurbish the interior, including the HVAC, or was it just going to be the old building? I mean, no, the plan, the, there was a plan to, to refurbish the building to convert it to office space, and we're still doing that. But the HVAC, as Jerry pointed out, the HVAC was adequate. So except to change some of the ventilation uh, um, systems in the, in the ceiling and, and change some of the controls, there was very little that was planned to be done to the HVAC system. So if we look back at what was presented to you by the private corporation for a build out on that particular property, we won't find a replacement of the HVAC. No, sir, the, you will not. Okay. Um, and how much was going to be dedicated of that original number of 120 million to ventilation in the MUD headquarters? I can't break that out for you, sir. I can tell you that the total valuation of the uh, um, refurbishing of that building was set at 3.8. That would include all the offices and, and uh, replacing some of the uh, uh, parts of the, of the building that needed refurbishing to accommodate some of the offices and refurbish the office space. Okay, 3.8 million to refurbish the entire building and now an additional 3.3, basically doubling the price of, of refurbishing that building. Rough math. I, I, I appreciate your candor. Thank you. Sir. Are you through? Commissioner Kavanaugh? Yes, thank you. Commissioner Boyle. Hey, Commissioner Duda, trying to bring it back to the subject, and that's that's really what it is for me, because uh, what this comes down to is that we are voting today uh, whether to uh, provide a safe facility. This this is going to be built. I mean, I've I've brought up and uh, kind of rocked the boat on. We got to tear that building down. Is what we got to do. But all we have to do is save the shell. Uh, but I don't think it's that cool anyway. I think it ought to go. But we already had some roundabouts with that. But the issue before us today is we're, we are going to be remodeling that building for the use of young people coming in and probation coming out of the key line building into that facility. And the, the question is, should we provide clean air and safe air for the children and for the parents and for the attorneys, for the, whoever's there in probation and all the rest of it? Should we provide clean air or not? So if you're against clean air for kids, <laughs> vote no. I mean, I'm not enthused about this project, but I'm voting yes because the majority has already spoken several times. And to clarify on this, a vote of the people is not required under state law. The very building we're in, I don't know how your father voted when he was on the county board. Maybe he voted no for this building, I'm not sure. But this building we're in was not voted, was, was not voted on by the people. And the Thomas Fitzgerald home, when it was built, my reference was, that was not voted on by the people. So. You know, to, to set this up as some kind of a scheme and something sneaky, it's been very public. I'm not a fan of the nonprofit group either. So, I mean, there are questions that I've had, but I have to come to grips with the majority. And I'm not in the majority on this. But I am on the clean air for the kids. So I'm going to vote yes on this. That's the question. Thank you. I don't say this often, Commissioner Boyle, but that was well put. Thanks. I'm going to have to get a copy of that. <laughs> <laughs> Further questions or comments? then I would like to call for the vote on A1, please. Just want to note on the agenda request form, uh, there's two different amounts listed, so folks should disregard the amount for 412,000. It's the 3.518 million, so. 3.581. 3.581, yes, all right. Motion passes, Commissioner Kavanaugh voting no, all other commissioners voting yes. Thank you. Item two, DC CARES Rental Assistance Program update and consideration to increase the maximum rental assistance award per household to, to $7,000. Melissa, Melissa Seawick, our general assistance director. We thought
thought she had a low profile job until the last few months. <laughs> <laughs> to just thank you, Melissa. I've seen your emails and everything you've done and really appreciate your calling people back. And I know Commissioner Boyle commented to you also. Thanks for what you're doing very, very much. All right, Melissa Sewick, Director of General Assistance. So first, I'm just gonna provide you all with an update as far as the program goes. And then I will um, talk about the possible increase to the maximum award. And this has also been emailed to all of you. So just as a reminder, Douglas County Cares Rental Assistance Program provides funds to assist the low to moderate income households that are at or below 100% AMI with um, unpaid rent due to COVID-19 related hardship and the maximum benefit um, is $4,000. We have received 2,941 valid applications. As of yesterday, 2,153 landlords have completed their portion of the application. A little over 1,500 of, of the applications have been processed and we have our hands on 89% of those that are still in process. So out of the 569, we have 89% of those that we are still working on. We're still awaiting the landlord responses from 788 applications. That's about 27% of the applications we have received. Um, again, we are reaching out to um, landlords that um, it is just either a finger flub and what the email address said, or if the tenant and landlord said the same, had the same email address, we're reaching out to those folks to try to get it clarified so we can get them into the system and have those completed. Overall, I am impressed with it only being 27%. Um, that we're still waiting from just knowing um, our program and knowing some of the responses. Um, we're really trying to push tenants to communicate with their landlords ahead of time, making sure that they have that correct um, contact information, but also let them know that when they get this email, it's not just spam or something like that. that they're aware that this, the tenant is applying for the program. The average monthly request for rent assistance we're receiving is $25 um, to $2,600, and the average monthly um, request has been $861.66. Um, as far as the months being requested, and this is for cases that we have currently processed or are being processed 24% April forward, 20% for May forward and June forward. 19% for July forward, 13% August forward, and 4% September forward. And we will be opening up October assistance um, by the end of this week. As far as our denials, we've had 976 applications that have been denied. 25 of those have just been for being over the 100% AMI for the household size. 842 are for insufficient documentation and or unable to verify financial hardship. 109 unable to verify financial hardship due to COVID-19. Um, that's typically just that they are over income um, or not over income, but they just had did not have a financial loss at all between um, before COVID and after COVID. Applicants can reapply for assistance and most of the initial denials have reapplied. So I'm hoping I will come back at the end of the month to report again on this program. And I hope at that time that we have the report that shows out of all of the folks that have that initial denial, how many of them have since come back and applied um, and be approved. Because I don't think, um, so I don't think, I know that the 976 applications, um, that's not an accurate gauge of how many people have then since been applied, approved for assistance. As far as approvals goes, we've had 608 approvals. And we've had, that has totaled up to just over $1.1 million in assistance that's been authorized. And that's been authorized in um, seven weeks from the first time we have submitted our, um, our initial payment. Approval amounts have ranged from $25 to $4,000. And then 18% of applications, um, their awards were between $3,000 and $4,000. And I just wanted to note that um, based on my request of um, increasing that amount to $7,000. 
Um, we have probably right now about 4% of people that have already maxed out on the assistance of $4,000, and the remainder of those are probably about a payment away, depending on what their monthly payment is. The average assistance being approved is $1,833.83. Um, we continue to look at this program, their eligibility, the documentation required, and the, the grant amounts that um, we are giving. And we're updating them um, as needed and as, as necessary based on what's coming in, what we're seeing. We're also looking at what other counties and cities are doing um, throughout this entire process, and we continue to do so. I again looked yesterday. We are one of um, we offer one of the, the highest financial grants out of any city in any county. I found one um, city that is doing a f higher grant than we are based on our $4,000 um, eligibility. We have one of the highest, we go up to the highest AMI. Most of the cities and counties go from 50 to 80% max um, AMI. And as far as the documentation that is required, we align with most um, of the cities and counties. Um, the ones that we don't align with are because they're asking for more documentation. They're asking for six months of bank statements. They are asking for six months of pay stubs, um, none of that we, which we are doing. So, um, and there's been things that we have changed just along the process regarding our applications, how we ask questions. Um, then also, it used to be that when we initially started the program that you had to provide income verification for before COVID, considered uh, March 17th and then after COVID. We're seeing that um, obviously some people are having difficulty getting that um, income requirement before March, that um, whether that's a pay stub or bank statements, but we're also seeing that there was, there's people that have been unemployed but have since got employment post March but then have now been affected by COVID. So we have kind of changed those requirements that they just have to provide one month's proof of financial impact um, before COVID and after, and there's really no dates attributed to that other than being between March and the current date. Um, and then we're also looking at households that um, their children are participating in e-learning because we're seeing a lot of individuals that have either had to quit their job or they are working one or two days um, less a week due to the fact that they have to be home with their children. And so we are um, looking at that as well, where they're just attesting that they have a child that's participating in e-learning um, and providing us with their financials. And that is also um, eligibility that we are looking at. Um, and then again, for information on our website, it's www.douglascounty-ne.gov. And then our help desk line is 402-444-7230. Oh, that's my phone number, 7232. Um, and so I just wanted to point out, um, I you know, sent it in an email to you all, but you know, Tiffany and myself are pretty much the main ones that are overseeing this program um, internally in our department. And we are easily taking 100 calls um, a day just ourselves. Um, not that not coming through the help desk where we are talking to landlords, we are talking to tenants. And overall, the message we're hearing is very positive. Um, the folks that have been denied for incomplete um, information or insufficient information, we're able to provide them exactly what they need and they have then turned around and submitted it and they are getting approved. We have some cases now that we are caught up that are getting approved um, within a day or two of them submitting their applications. Um, and then we also are working on clearing out some of these um, applications that have been sitting there for probably about a month or so that we have been trying to communicate with to get the information that we need that they're just not replying or just not submitting it. So we're trying to close that out in hopes that they will turn around and then reapply and provide us with the information that they need. Um, and there are some organizations um, that we're working with one-on-one -on -one, um, like Dr. Ellis's um, organization where we are learning of um, a barrier with um, where they may be able to speak um, English, but as far as reading and write, it's writing, it's not, um, it's not proficient. So once we're aware of that, we are asking that those organizations give us a list of those individuals. And so we are CCing them in all email communications so they can help follow up on all of those. Um, we do ask in our application process if they will need a translator, if we do further communication, um, majority of those are selecting that they do not, and so we're basing it off of that, and then coming to find out after we communicate with these organizations that there's stuff that we can do to kind of help that that process, and which has we have been successful with 
um, and we'll continue to do so. So I'm very proud of what we've been doing. Again, over a million dollars has gone out in seven weeks um, since this program has been implemented. And do I cancel? Okay. Um, and that's kind of unheard of in our community. Um, and we'll continue to go ahead and distribute the funds. We're monitoring um, you know, what is else is going on in the community. We are reaching out to school systems, all of the different nonprofits, um, for-profit organizations, trying to get the message out as clearly as we can. Um, I don't think that we are missing populations, um, large populations that people just don't know about our program. If you look at nationally where we're at, Omaha, Nebraska, and just Nebraska as a whole is in a lot better state than um, other states nationally. So um, I think that is reflecting based on this assistance program and the funds that are going out. And then lastly, we're, communi we're communicating with the utility programs as well. Um, if somebody is eligible and approved on our program, they will be approved on the utility side as well based on the requirements. Um, we've been meeting weekly with them just to try to um, talk about any problems or concerns that we are seeing and if there's anything that we can do differently. Um, based on our program eligibility and our program requirements, there is not anything else we can do in order to make it um, any easier for anybody to simplify the process without risking um, not being in compliance with the CARES funding source. So. Um, we're confident in what we're doing. We're confident that the message is getting out. Um, again, $1.1 million has already gone out into the community, um, and we're hearing the positive messages day in and day out about how grateful that, um, that the constituents are that you guys authorized this funding to go out into the community. That said, um, we are seeing that some people are hitting that cap already of that $4,000 um, where they just are still not employed or they had employment and then now with the schools back in session that they still have um, some, some needs for that rental assistance. So we are asking that um, the, maximum incre the maximum amount of rent being authorized is $7,000 per household. We're looking at an average amount of $1,000 being allocated each month to a household, and we are looking from April to October, so that $7,000 amount. Um, so that's what we are hoping to do. Um, if that is approved, what we are gonna do is go back and um, communicate with all of those folks that may have not gotten, um, or maybe they just got a partial payment or they didn't need ongoing, they were not eligible for ongoing assistance because they reached that cap to see if they need assistance still and then go ahead and issue assistance for those individuals. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Commissioner Boyle. Well, I, I say this every time you show up, but uh, you're doing a remarkable job, just absolutely. Uh, and you, how long have you been in the job? <laughs> I, I mean, as, as head of the director. Just over, just over a year. Okay, well, this is really incredible. You took this over and uh, you had big shoes to fill yep. and uh, size 12 shoes, what size? No, I'm just joking, but you've really done a terrific job. I, even the presentations that you make are very readable and uh, you know, you're know you cheap. I like that you use both sides of the paper, that's good. But I do have some questions about it and I I wanna ask you, are the the uh, requirements put together by Deloitte, is that what, what happened? They, they said you have to do all these things, is that where it came from? No, they have advised us um, of certain specifications just dealing with the CARES Act, but um, when we were looking at what other cities and counties were doing, when okay. we researched what um, is required for this grant, that's where they have all come from. So it's not um, because of Deloitte said one thing or another. Okay. So how would it be possible for you to, the reason I ask is that uh, I see, you know, there uh, some of the applications that have been denied, those are the ones I always look at naturally. and. I get concerned about 842 inf insufficient documentation and then 109 unable to verify financial hardship due to COVID-19. Uh, what is that last thing? How do you verify financial hardship due to the, the virus? How's, how, what do you need to see? So in order to determine a financial hardship, we are asking for one month's income before you've had that hardship and then one month's income after. So that can be in the form of pay stubs, direct deposit, unemployment benefits, um, and like I said, that number of 108, okay. that is due to, we got the appropriate documentation, but based on that, there was no hardship due to COVID-19. They were either making the same amount or more with the okay. information that they provided. All right, well, is there any way that you could, it seems to me that, I mean, if I were there, I don't know what the nonprofit agencies do. They're not, I don't know that they're under any 
federal problem or anything trying to verify their people's ability to pay and whether they're being honest. But I guess what I'd like to see is, you know, asking for copies of the money orders or uh, if they have a checking account, showing proof of what they paid for rent. And then, you know, are, do you have income now? They're just a couple of things. And I, having the landlord, it seems like, landlord providing forms has been kind of a stumbling block. Uh, maybe I'm incorrect on that. I did send the name of uh, uh, Gene Eckel, who's an attorney who is very involved in, in the other side of the, of the equation of evicting people. He represents landlords. But he stopped me one day when I was trying to do something about the evictions downstairs. And, and uh, anyway, I talked to him briefly, and he's offered to help to try to intervene with landlords and try to get them. If there's somebody not cooperating, try to talk them and get them to prevent. So anyway, anything I can do to help, I hope you'll give me a call. Uh, I'm very impressed with how you've responded. You were responding to me even before you started all this, so uh, I, I don't know where in heaven you came from, but you just dropped right <laughs> down to us, and we appreciate your work and your effort. The other thing I really appreciate very much, and this is a compliment, uh, you have the right attitude about people who need help, and that's yep. so important. Yep. Uh, if you are cold or callous, not seeing the problems of people, you're in the wrong place. You are in the right place because you have what I affectionately call a bleeding heart. <laughs> That's what I am too. You, you try to help people any way you possibly can. And um, so anyway, I appreciate your effort, appreciate your attitude, and uh, you're doing a great job. Thank you. And I wanted to point out as far as the landlord, landlords go, the only documentation that we require for the, from them is that W-9. Yeah. And then also just for them to attest to how much rent is owed. Yeah. Um, and then what if there's any late fees attributed to that. So there's nothing beyond that that we really ask of the landlords. Um, so majority of it does fall on the tenant. But again, the only thing that we are asking from the tenant is we ask for a copy of their ID, their identification, and then proof of income. So like you said, that can be in the form of bank statements. It can be like via direct deposits, pay stubs, a letter from their um, employer. It's, it, it, we accept a wide range yeah. of documentation. And then, and that helps us determine obviously what that household's AMI is and if they've been negatively impacted by COVID. Uh, are you familiar, have you, did I send you any information on lending link? Uh, no. Okay, well I need to do that because I, I discovered, I called uh, uh, Roger Garcia and said I needed his help and he got a coffee and I said, we, I know he used to be on the, uh, uh, the group uh, helping immigrants uh, come in to Immigrant Center. Mm -hmm. And so he went, he came back, he called me, and I had lunch. We had lunch with three of us. And there's a fellow named Daniel Padilla, and uh, he worked for 23 years at the First National Bank. He was recruited to run this uh, lending agency that, frankly, competes with the people who charge 400%. And he charges 5%. And they've had something like 1,200 loans made in six weeks. They also have an angel grant system if someone can't make a, a payment, they can also do grants. I'll get the information to okay. you because there are there's help out there, and um, it's really remarkable. It's being funded by some of the usual suspects that are so generous to our community. Okay. So it's really a neat operation. I'll get it to you. Okay, great. So people that don't qualify can possibly go there. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just have to add, I've had several constituents, people, whatever, just write directly to me looking for help, and boy, all I do is forward the emails to Melissa, and she gets them taken care of immediately. Yep. She has been wonderful to work with from, really? from our perspective. <laughs> yep. Commissioner Morgan. So you mentioned uh, the outstanding job that's going on here compared to other cities. You mentioned there was one city. What was the city that you said uh, was doing so well? Or I don't recall because I've looked at so many, <laughs> um, but there, there was only one that I found that is um, authorizing a higher amount of assistance than oh, we do, okay. and but they're monthly. They have a monthly cap, so okay. um, it was a four-month max. So um, technically, we might still be better than them, um, depending oh, on how you look at it. But we, I definitely think I nationally our general assistance program, um, what the county offers, it far exceeds what other counties' general assistance programs are doing, um, and I think that also reflects with this general this rental assistance program is what we're seeing uh, different counties and different cities doing um, it's a lot simpler and it's a lot more um, assistance that's being provided and so you're comparing it with all cities counties right whether it's san diego county or right. whatever yeah we're not looking at sizes we're just strictly doing looking it. at the cities and the counties absolutely 
And the real credit to you is what you said earlier about taking these calls that you yourself have taken, you know, what, whatever. If it's up to 100 calls a day, uh, you know, and the difference. And that's really made the difference. And I don't think you have a bleeding heart, but I think you have a tremendous passion about what you're doing. And that's what life is really about that's a in the heart. job you do. <laughs> I know that... Uh, Commissioner Boyle does have the passion about trying to always do the right thing. I don't think he has a bleeding heart either, but he uh, he's okay. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Commissioner Rogers. Uh, Melissa, hey, so uh, I want to be able to correlate uh, slide four, right? So does slide four mean that of the 1.1 million that has been approved for rental assistance, that 24% of it was given out in April, 20 was given out in May. Am I reading that right? No, that, okay. so for the month's assistance requested, that has been, that's what's requested from the applicant on their application. So 24% um, of the applications we had processed were requesting April forward. Okay. Um, and then look 20% May forward. That said, when we are finally communicating with the landlords and the tenants, that always, does not always match up. We're finding that a lot of people are just clicking all of the boxes that are available, and then when we are processing, they only need one or two months of assistance. Um, so that is, and so uh, that's another thing that we're hoping to get documentation and get reports on to show what specific months we are paying for folks. We're seeing a lot of stuff now come in specifically for September and newer applications where they had not applied for previous assistance. Um, and I'm attributing that to the end in that additional unemployment um, where people were able to pay for their rent and then now they're not able to do so. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, it would be, oh, Commissioner Bergeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to extend my thank yous to Melissa as well. I mean, just, just the comment you made at the end the, in seven weeks, we one million dollars has gone out to assistance to our Douglas County residents, and that's big. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't believe the program struggled to get started because it was off and running with a few weeks when we approved the use of this program. Um, it it uh, nothing's ever perfect. And I think you've proven that as you've gone along, we've tried to fix what we don't think is working or that needs to be changed. Um, and that I think is, again, kudos to you as the leader and kudos to the staff who are working on these applications. Um, it can't, again, all fall on those who are processing the applications, there has to be some ownership of it of those who are applying as well. And I think you've proven that you have taken this and told the staff that we're going to work these and we're going to work them so we don't have to deny them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there are times when we have to, but again, seven weeks and $1 million gone out in assistance is pretty impressive. And again, thank you for your leadership on this. Does anybody want to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Commissioner Cavanaugh. Thank you, Bill. Um, and this is great, uh, going from uh, 4,000 to 7,000. I think it's something that we talked about, uh, you know, earlier when we came to the realization that the program was getting set up four months into the pandemic, and it had a four-month limitation on it. And it was apparent at that point that we would have to continue it and we have to the end of the year it's also uh, apparent that the original 4,000 was going to be inadequate and so continuing that in a similar fashion makes all kinds of sense and I, I support that it's a good example of what we were talking about with dr. else regarding the back and forth of this conversation I mean this thing isn't perfect and we're building it as we go but we're trying to make it as good as we can and you see these adjustments made along the way are attempts to do that. So um, these are responses to uh, the needs of the community. 
This is one of our best CARES program because it's direct assistance to people affected by COVID and need in our community. That's the highest and best use of COVID dollars. So what we're trying to do are these fine tuning of it and uh, that relies a lot on people's input from the outside world saying this isn't working or this could work better or this is inadequate and this needs to be increased. This is a response to that. Obviously the original four months was an inadequate period of time and that's now been continued uh, to uh, encompass the entire year. Obviously the initial $4,000 was inadequate and that's being upped uh, to 7,000. The problem that, that you see uh, before you is <clears throat> we have way more applications denied than approved. And I'm glad to hear that we're going back and looking at those and seeing how we can get aid to people who may have had just difficulty in the application process. We also have 1.1 million to date uh, expended out of 10 million. And uh, that's going to be interesting going forward, how we get that amount of a balance of about $9 million uh, out to people by the end of the year because this has to be expended as CARES requires by the end of the year. So I understand um, what you're doing here today and I applaud the um, work that general assistance has been doing and the flexibility that you've shown meeting the needs of the applicants, which is the, the highest goal of the, uh, of the project so that we can get through this pandemic uh, as well as possible using the resources that we have. Um, the numbers uh, that we see, I, I think, if you'll correct me if I'm wrong, have been going up every month in terms of applications. Is that right? As far as the applications received or? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. People are applying every day. So our numbers are going to increase. And we're having, like I said, as far as our September data, we're seeing a lot of unduplicated um, apps for September that they are new applicants that have not applied previously that are now applying for September for the first time. That's excellent. Thank you. Thanks for the good work you're doing. I know that it's a struggle and if you need more resources, uh, you know, handling 100 calls a day has got to be tra taxing. Uh, you know, please let us know. I mean, the General Assistance Department didn't start this year set up to deal with this kind of a load and so Obviously, if you need some more help, let us know. I think um, you know we're we're handling it fine. I like that we're able to talk to landlords and talk to tenants um, about their specific issues, questions, concerns. Um, again, we just want to get the continue to get the message out and have it. Um, we want. I know it's not always going to be a positive spin. Um, some of the stuff that we've been hearing. Um, is not always positive, but I think it is an amazing program that's being offered that you know you guys have um, approved for the county. I think what we have done is amazing. Um, we continue to adapt our program as we're seeing um, as as we see fit. And also, like your your comment regarding the the four months and then the four thousand dollars. When we initially started this program, we were hearing from you know different organizations that there was a thirty five million dollar rental need, and we were seeing very high figures. And the thought of keeping it at $4,000 in four months was more so that we can reach more individuals rather than having it be, um, you know, nine, ten thousand dollar cap and only helping a select few in Douglas County, kind of like that first come, first serve. We're seeing that the need is not as great as has been said, um, and so we can open it up, or we're able to assist the individuals that have applied with more assistance, which is a great thing. Um, and we're gonna continue to um, approve that assistance to, through the end of the year. So um, we're, you know, we're confident what we're doing. It is a grind, um, but it's been very fulfilling and I'm really proud of what we're doing. Well, thank you. And we look forward to a robust discussion on this, uh, particularly regarding these qualifications and what we could do maybe to make it uh, easier for people to apply and be approved on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rogers. Uh, I just, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to, Commissioner Boyle made a comment of asking uh, where Melissa was, where she came from trajectory. I just want to put on the record that she's a, a, a great example of uh, somebody born and bred within the department uh, from her days. And I don't know if it was a community specialist under Jan Pelletier 
to the elevation to deputy to now. So um, all that good work is credited to the development and then the attentional track they put her on. So I, I just want to add to that and, and uh, add to her great job and, and note that trajectory for you. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Commissioner Rogers. Commissioner Borgeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Melissa, when you were talking about the landlords, are we talking a big number or are we talking a handful, a dozen? Um, as far as? Like that you're still trying to get information from or so that aren't being it, cooperative? So as far as the ones that are not cooperating with us, th those are very, very few. Um, some of it is just kind of a misunderstanding of where the funding is coming from. Um, I've had a couple of those conversations just this week where they, they think it's something else. Um, so it's just clarifying that. Um, there's some landlords that don't want to accept the assistance because they want to be able to evict that tenant. Um, but for the most part, they're willing to work with us. I think the biggest thing is just being communicated or, oh yeah, I did see that email, but I didn't know what it was about, um, or I just thought it was spam. And so that's why we continue to say, like tell the tenants, communicate with them, let them know. Um, and we're having a lot of tenants that say, my landlord said they haven't got anything yet. So then we're reaching out to the landlords and we're CCing the tenant. So it's linking that, okay. that communication. So um, like I said, I know to somebody maybe who's not involved in um, this type of assistance, 27% may seem like a lot. Um, and it definitely is for those folks that have not had their landlord uh, submit their, their proof yet. But I am really impressed that it is that low um, of a landlord response that have not responded. And also there are some tenants who have since reapplied. And so they have those two applications sitting in our thing. One has marked as submitted, and that means the landlord has not completed their portion, but then that second application, the landlord has submitted it. We go through as best as we can to mark duplicates, um, but when we're looking at almost 3,000 applications, it gets kind of difficult to do that, especially um, if we don't have key things to look at as far as email um, to cross-reference. But um, again, we continue to get it out there. I don't feel at all that there's just landlords that aren't aware of the program. Um, there's some that we have worked with different organizations where they want a point of contact because they haven't filled out that application and we're able to provide that to them. Um, we're reaching out to them um, to find out if there's a reason because sometimes it's just a miscommunication. Sometimes when we call the landlord, we find out a lot more um, of the story of why they're not filling it out and they're not going to. Um, but thankfully, most of the landlords want their money um, and they wanted it yesterday. So they are willing to work with us and have been great to work with. Um, most of the tenants, the same thing. They're just super grateful for the program. A lot of them, when we get a lot of the back to back to back calls, people are just stressed out. They're concerned, they're scared because they don't want to be evicted. So we're also providing people with assistance to um, legal aid, but then also with the moratorium through the CDC, trying to get them to fill that out um, to prevent evictions throughout the, the remainder of the year, but also knowing still apply for this program, still have us assist you because those that rent is going to come due, those late fees are going to come due. Um, and if we can't assist trying to get them um, linked up with another, a different organization, that does. Well, and I, the last thing, I'm glad you brought up about the um, uh, prior to COVID and just again, for clarification, these dollars have to be COVID related. Yes. So we understand that there are rent burdened individuals in our county prior to COVID um, and they may not qualify for these funds. And again, this program that we, we put in place for, again, COVID specific, isn't a long-term fix for Correct. the problem that we have in this county with rent burden individuals. So I think that when we first start talking about it, I think it was thrown out there that this was the end all be all. It was going to take care of everybody. It was going to be, you know, this big like $38 million right. um, expenditure for individuals in our county. And that just isn't the case. So again, we have specific requirements we have to follow. Um, and again, just short term, not long term, we got work to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, we don't have a motion before us, but I would entertain one. Oh, sorry. All right. All right. So, motion by Commissioner Kavanaugh, second by Commissioner Boyle. Further comments or questions to the motion? Then, could we please vote?
Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Item three under the CARES Act update is approval to allocate $1,203,272 of CARES Act funds to the Douglas County Youth Center for COVID related projects. Okay, I will second that. Questions or comments to the motion? Commissioner Cavanaugh. To relate back to what we talked about for the MUD building where you approved $3.3 million to redo their HVAC so the kids could have clean air, um, there's no money for HVAC upgrade at the Douglas County Youth Center, which currently has and will for the foreseeable future somewhere between 70 and 80 kids staying there every single night. Now, the MUD building is not going to have any kids staying there overnight and it's not even going to come online probably for a year or two. But tonight, and every night during this pandemic, kids are going to sleep at the Douglas County Youth Center where you're not spending anything on an HVAC upgrade. Just a point to show you the disparity in interest between the uh, scheme across the street and the kids that we actually have under our care at 42nd and Walworth Street. I support this. I'm just pointing out that there's a vast disparity in what we're doing. Thank you. Further comments or questions? Then I would call for the vote, please. Uh, Commissioner Morgan, how do you vote? Okay, motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Next on the agenda are two items that we're not ready for today, I believe. Items B and C is report from uh, the purchase, purchasing agent on emergency purchases that haven't occurred yet. And so those two items will come back to our agenda next week. Which brings us down to public hearings and, and I've been keeping the Carls waiting so long, I'm going to move you to the head of the list uh, for public hearings. Um, so next on our agenda is item 6B. Yeah, you only had to wait, what, three hours for it. So. To amend the seasonal limitation on operations in condition number two of the special use permit, this is allowing the drive-in movie theater on North 300th Street uh, to have a longer season. What are, we, what are, how are things going? What are you, what are you looking for here? Well, are we I, opening the public hearing then? I'm sorry, this oh, is I'm a sorry. public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we Thank appreciate you. the time. You guys have a very full dance card. Thank you for saving one of them for us. Um, my name is Jeff Carls with the Quasar Drive-In of Fremont, Nebraska, 1898 Phelps Avenue. Uh, Jenny and I are here today. We had uh, a pretty extensive list of conditional uses on our conditional use permit for the drive-in. One of those uh, is item two, and that one was originally um, to come to the board to seek approval for a second screen. We're installing one screen on the property, and then pending how traffic flow and everything works with the facility, we would come back and ask permission for the second screen. Um, something that got it added to that at some point between when we left the Planning and Zoning Commission and came before the board for the final vote, um, there was also a window that was added into that that is from Memorial Day to Labor Day, um, which we didn't necessarily agree with, but after coming a year and a half through the process, we weren't <laughs> going to scrap it and start over again. We thought we'll come back and address line items as needed. So that is what we're asking today is on that item number two to basically remove any restriction on the timeline of when we can be open. You wouldn't ask a lawn service to not cut grass after November 1st because, well, that's past your window. Uh, we want to be able to serve the community and be able to operate this fall when we're through with construction and when we're open. I've got a fairly extensive list of folks that I've kind of corresponded with and dealt with through the summer in trying to get um, accommodations for them, whether that's the Ronald McDonald House or with the JDRF. There are all kinds of people that are very excited about coming out to the drive-in and working with us to either whether help raise funds for their cause or to get exposure um, or just to have some place for a corporate event. Uh, to come out for the evening and have a movie uh, that is car centric that's a uh, you know there's been a lot more demand for our services since COVID-19 became a thing um, you know people didn't even know about drive-ins anymore until uh, <laughs> March 17th I think you said the yeah. date was yeah. so we've been inundated with that and 
you know, obviously construction plans never go as planned, so we're still under construction, but we've made a lot of progress this summer. Our screen is finished, our grading and, and infield roads are done. We've got, you know, our building is going up this week, the, the framing and stuff for our, our concession building, and we hope to be able to host some shows this fall, especially in the Halloween season, because that is a natural go-to with the drive-in, to be able to do, you know, a horror movie festival on one night for, you know, horror movie buffs and maybe have something, you know, that was more kid-friendly on the Saturday night showing. And we're just really excited. And that hard start and hard stop seemed a little bit unreasonable. And we would just like to scratch that verbiage from the conditional use. Thank you, Commissioner. Jenny wants to say anything? Boyle. I drove out for the groundbreaking, and it was really exciting to see uh, Jeff and Jenny and their family there. I have to make a personal comment. They're uh, uh, just a really strong family, with great values. Uh, they just really are uh, the kind of people that um, uh, America stands for. You're just a really a great family. I don't mean to go overboard on it, but I observed you and how your children act and all the rest of it, your friends. Anyway, I, would, I, I think that just like any other business, they ought to have the ability to uh, open when, as weather dictates. I mean, if it turns out just like this last week, we had this beautiful span of weather. If that had been a weekend and you were ready, you could have opened for the weekend for something. Correct. I think that we need to uh, lift this restriction and let them operate as they see fit. I, I know I very, I trust them tremendously. They are very good neighbors. Uh, you know, they have uh, uh, their farms in the area. <clears throat> I have relatives who farm in Lachera and farm in Saunders County, and so. Uh, I know that in Valley in that area. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, I, it's a respected profession, and, and this is a great one. This is really exciting to see this happen. It'll be a wonderful addition to our community. So I hope that uh, I'd like to see us remove that uh, restriction and let them operate as any other business person would, uh, really. They re you, re you need that ability. Correct. Thank you, Commissioner Boyle. Thank yeah. you. Commissioner Morgan. <clears throat> I agree with what Commissioner Boyle said, and when we close the public hearing, you know, I plan to second or make the motion that we allow you that totally and wish you the best of success. Be great. Commissioner Cavanaugh. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this. This is, this is great. I've been excited about this since the first time you brought it to us, and I, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, growing up, I have lots of fond memories of uh, going to the drive-in. We used to pop popcorn at home and bring it to the drive-in. That's how down home it was. We'd appreciate it if you didn't. I know. I know. <laughs> that was back in the day. What, what can I say? Here's my one question, it, and I hope you can do it this fall. I hope the weather and, and construction and everything uh, cooperates on that. What's the first film? We, we put it out there, and this is because going back to the first VCR we ever bought from Rose at Nebraska Furniture Mart, we brought home a copy of American Graffiti, and that's been the first thing that gets played on any new video equipment in our, in the Carl's household, since I was five years old. <laughs> so we've got it set up to be um, our soft opening, which will be kind of the, let's try to break it with friends and family. We're gonna show American Graffiti at that with maybe another car movie, but our first public opening uh, double feature movie will be American Graffiti in Greece. That's so, great. That's right. great. Well, good luck, and uh, be sure and give us a heads up. I'll be there. Almost definitely. Buying popcorn. <laughs> Very good. Commissioner Borgeson. Well, thank you for coming before us and giving us the um, background information. One of the things that um, did bother me is that the change after you left the public hearing and came here, um, so I'm glad that we can take item by item and talk about it. Um, I think, again, your biggest um, point in terms of we are looking for something, a gathering spot for people to be able to go to during this COVID, and this is um, absolutely a, a perfect venue for that. And so um, I, too, support, as I told you, the, um, the uh, extending of the uh, or taking that restriction off um, because, again, I think that not only during this time, but Again, we need some good, wholesome activities for families um, and kids to be able to attend, and this is one of them, so thank you. And I apologize for not making the 
groundbreaking. I Morris. wasn't making uh, public appearances due to my husband's I told him to stay home because yeah. it was right after everybody was kind of hunkering yeah. down. It's like, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. You yeah. can see so how well he takes He's orders. very stubborn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I was with you in spirit, but due to my husband's health, I wasn't making public appearances. Completely so, understood. Um, but I was with you, and I'm excited for this to open and hopefully can make it when you do um, the initial opening. So We are, too. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I will say that the idea of the, the public hearing that we're having, the special use permit that you have been granted, mm -hmm. is to allow for more public input. To allow, And as I told you before the meeting, man, do you guys have a lot of friends. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I have just been overwhelmed at the number of emails. And, and what I love is they're not all form letters where people, it's, these are all individual, sincere messages of support from people in your neck of the woods. I, I mean, that's that's how the system works. If you've got the support of the neighbors, uh, we're more likely to go along with what you want to do. We want to be our, respectful of them as well. Our communities have been great. And I, I say communities because we'll, we'll serve Omaha, Lincoln, Fremont, Valley area, Bl F Blair, folks from all around, and they've all been so supportive and so helpful with anything that we've needed to get figured out or to get accomplished through this has been it's we're very blessed very good would anybody else like to address this group during this public hearing if not i will close the public hearing if you'd like to make the motion i'll second it everybody wants to make the motion <laughs> <laughs> okay commissioner borgeson making the motion commissioner second Morgan seconded great further questions or comment to the motion then could we please vote Motion passes six to zero. Very good. Good luck. Thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. We'll see you next year about the second screen. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I will come back now to item A on the public hearings, and that is the hearing to set the final tax rate for 2021. Joe? Go. All right. We have a motion to approve. Well, we're, if the public hearing's open. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So what are we looking at here, Joe? Um, as you know, on um, August 25th, we approved the budget. And so the second part is what we're going to do today, and that's approve the actual levy. And the levy is, con is consistent as based on the budget that was approved. And so just the highlights, you can see this form. Uh, there's lots of numbers on it now. This came down from Lincoln last year about putting, putting it in this format. But um, just the highlight here is that the levy uh, for the county as a whole will remain unchanged at 29.559 cents. Uh, which, like I say, is unchanged from last year. And then the, there's also a levy that gets approved today uh, for the library, and that went up uh, a fair amount. Uh, it's 3.12 cents, and that what went up driven by, uh, we basically matched the spending of the city uh, on a per capita basis, and the city uh, increased their support for the library. So. Uh, to, to match that under the terms of the interlocal agreement is, is why that goes up. Uh, and uh, so here's the data. Like I say, it's basically consistent with the budget and the um, levy is flat. So with that, I take any questions. Okay. Any questions for Joe? Yes, Commissioner Cavanaugh. Thank you. And Joe, thanks for this. Um, the uh, handout is instructive because I think uh, a couple of years ago, this is a property tax increase question, and um, a couple of years ago, the legislature saw what was going on around the state where property taxes would go up, but the mill levy wouldn't go up, and the local government, county board, city council, whatever, would say, hey, no tax increase. So they passed a law that said, oh, if you're going to do that, you must tell people there's a property tax increase. That's what this is. So if you go onto this page, and this is because of state statute, that wasn't done before, 
you'll see 2019, 2020 property tax requests, $140,107,725 for Douglas County. And you will see down the page, 2020, 2021 proposed property tax requests, $150,468,298, an increase of $10,360,000 $360,573. That's a property tax bill that's increased over $10 million in a year. They're telling you that, we're telling you that because we are compelled by state statute, although it's not quite clear from this page, to tell you that. Here's taxation in a nutshell. Base, what's your property worth, times rate, what's the middle levy, equals the tax. If either of those things go up, your tax goes up. So last year, the base went up a little and the rate went up 16%. There was a mill levy increase and your tax went up as a result. This year, your base has gone up again. I think it's about 7%. Mill levy stays the same, but the tax goes up. Base times rate equals tax. So you're looking at a $10 million plus property tax increase on every property taxpayer in Douglas County. And um, this is something that I've talked about repeatedly. It wasn't gonna probably get much discussion this morning, but I'm not willing to pay that because it's unnecessary. We raised property tax rates, the mill levy last year, to pay again for an unnecessary scheme across the street and this is part and parcel of that. Had we not done that scheme across the street, your property tax amount would not necessarily have gone up. This is paying off a non-voter approved bond issue to build what is described as a kitty jail by PJ Morgan. I don't think, Mr. Morgan, I've actually used kitty jail as a phrase, but, um, that's unnecessary, that we don't need. We have Douglas County Youth Center, perfectly adequate. We could refurbish it for a lot less. You're doing a property tax increase vote here this morning. So I'm gonna vote against that. I shouldn't go there, but I have to come back to the building commission meeting where we were voting on going forward with the courthouse annex and, and the juvenile detention center. And Commissioner Kavanaugh came to the meeting and urged us to vote, to move forward with the courthouse annex. And I said, you understand, this will require a tax increase to pay for this. He said, I understand that. And he supported it at that time. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Boyle. Is it all, and I think when uh, PJ and I uh, work with Joe to look over these uh, these uh, spending uh, proposals, various offices, you know, we, we do have to recognize that uh, a large uh, number of our employees are unionized and uh, which I'm happy about. I think they need the right to have to bargain for working conditions and wages and so forth. So I'm very much a union, pro-union person. So, uh, but when that occurs, uh, they're entitled to be paid. You've called today, you called for uh, combat pay for people who are in the uh, correction facility and working with COVID. So where that money would come from, I don't know what you're thinking, but it would have to come from here. And um, so that, that could be pretty pricey. Uh, I think I suggested earlier, we look at a different working schedule that might cost money, but it may boost morale and end up with a better product. Um, you know, government services are not free. Uh, and believe me, no one thinks they are. And so we have the responsibility to provide the mental health op, uh, facilities, the care for the aged and elderly, Alzheimer patients. Uh, we have to care for the people who come into the mental health clinic. We took over the detox center that Catholic Charities uh, decided they didn't want to run, and, we're, and they're doing a great job over there. All these, uh, all these services that we serve, as I talked to this morning, and the difference between what the city does and the county, uh, we're the ones who uh, go directly to the people in most cases, although the city does quite a bit of that too. Um, no, these services are essential. Uh, it, it pays the, uh, for the uh, people like Melissa who showed up here and does such a great job and her staff and all the work she's doing. 
there's there's someone to be paid for doing that excellent work and uh, there's a price to it and this is it um, and I I don't think you know um, I understand what you're saying I, I'd rather I don't know what we would cut you know to tell you the truth we've looked at it there's maybe the branch offices for the treasurers he's got five maybe we should shut down four I don't know we should do what the state did they've only got two DMVs now one's out in uh, in France and a little bit west of France in 170th Street um, you'd have to, I'd have to stop and get gas a couple times to get there, I suppose. And Marianne, I'd stop at her house and get a sandwich or something. But anyway, so we got that going. And then you, the second place is over on 56th and Ames, and the next one's in Sarpy County. So there's nothing in this whole region where you can get a driver's license or whatever it is you need. You can't get it. So I, I've written to the governor and said, consider coming in with one of our branch offices or something. This isn't working. But anyway, that, that's more expense, too. The service to the public, um, that's what we do. and. Um, you know, we had to build uh, uh, on that uh, United Way building is being remodeled into a jury assembly because of COVID. And uh, it's gonna be about $300,000 to remodel it uh, so that it's suitable for jury assembly. We don't have a place where they can come and, and we only have this big room for anything and this is in high use. So all these costs I think are legitimate. They're considered one at a time. I think um, we're so fortunate, frankly, to, and I tell him too, Joe Lorenz is a standout. Uh, he really he has a full grasp of what our spending needs are, what our abilities are. Uh, he's uh, moved into this uh, position so well. Uh, we're so fortunate to have him. If anybody deserves combat pay, it's probably Joe. So, <laughs> but I, I want to say, I, I uh, you know, who's for a tax increase? Nobody. But and this really is not a. I mean, it's increased revenue and it's off property taxes. And the only thing we can do is try to treat people fairly when they come into the BOE and, and see what, if they are, and we did to this time. I think we did some good work. I'm not happy with how that operates, but uh, we tried to do the best we could. So bottom line is, this is uh, uh, nothing new. I understand what the, the state wants to do, but we only do what the state tells us to do. So if they want us not to spend money, then they have to cut our services and figure out what's going on. When mental health was transferred from the federal level to the state, it bounced down to the locality, and it never was the same. So we're doing the best we can, and I, I'm going to be. I'm going to vote yes for this. It's a, it's what we uh, came up with, and I think it's the best plan that we can possibly come up with. So Joe, thanks for your hard work. PJ, good to work with you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to address this board during this public hearing? Commissioner Cavanaugh. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, and what we're looking at here clearly uh, is a state mandated reveal of a $10 million plus uh, property tax increase uh, in Douglas County. Um, the idea of hazardous duty pay for our first responders and our healthcare providers is COVID related, mm -hmm. CARES money, not property tax. COVID that we had 166 million for that you just put 3.3 into the MUD building for, COVID related CARES funds do not come out of a property uh, tax bill for Douglas County. So that's what I was advocating for our first responders oh, yeah. and, yeah. and healthcare providers, COVID related CARES money. Uh, the property tax increase here is largely going to pay for the scheme across the street. And I have said from the beginning that if we had put the courthouse annex and even the MUD building on the ballot and let the people decide, I would have supported that. Didn't do that because you knew that the, what Commissioner Morgan calls kitty jail would not fly. The people don't support that idea. And that's what this tax increase is, is for. For the private corporation, which is now gonna get 3.3 million more uh, to do their construction scheme across the street at the property taxpayer's uh, expense. That's what we're voting on here today, property tax increase for a wasteful product, a wasteful project that we don't need, and I'm gonna vote no. You, you said the 3.3 million is coming out of property taxes? No, the 3.3 million is going on top of what- Okay, is, but it's not coming was out going of on top of what is, is already given to them. All right, thank you. Commissioner Morgan. Commissioner Kavanaugh, you are absolutely an amazing person. <laughs> for you to say to me, when I've asked you publicly here for weeks, weeks, yep. and 
I hope the other commissioners will tell me that I'm wrong on this. I don't want you to tell me. I have asked you to have respect for the juvenile uh, center and not call it a kitty jail because parents have called. You're the only one on this board who's ever used the word kitty jail. And I resent you trying to twist facts as you always do. And I've tried to stay quiet and allow you to continue your six to one voting record that you're so proud of. And I am really, really disgusted with you. And I want you to personally know that. And I've never said that to another elected official because I try to be respectful. But when you said that twice, I let the first time go that I called it a kitty jail. I would never do that. And I just want you to know that I think it's deplorable the way you twist facts. Okay. Well, Thank you. Because this is a personal attack, I have to point out to you that you can go back in the record, and I urge you to do that, and look for me ever calling it a kitty jail. You called it a kitty jail. Okay. I have never ever called it a K I D D Y jail, kitty jail. That is wrong, you are wrong, but you won't go back in the record. You will conflate what I have said, what a lot of people said about the kids jail with your kitty jail. I never said that, you said that this morning. Go and check the record and get your facts straight before you go attacking people. All right, I, I don't need to split hairs between a kitty jail and a kids jail. This is a public hearing about the county's budget request and I would like the conversation to come back to the budget, please. Further comments about the budget? All right. Uh, we will then close the public hearing. Um, what is the? I make a motion to approve if there's no motion out there. Th there is not. All right, motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Morgan. Uh, further questions or comments? Could we please vote? Thank you, Joe. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Motion passes. Commissioner Kavanaugh voting no, all our commissioners voting yes. Thank you. Brings us to public hearing on item C adoption of text changes to the county subdivision regulations, preliminary plat, and final plat uh, regarding notification distance to surrounding landowners from within one mile to within no, a quarter mile. I think we should postpone this for a month. Oh, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sitting I, back there. <laughs> I will open the public hearing and, and disregard Commissioner Boyle. Doug, what, what are we uh, looking at here? Okay, so about a month ago, you recall we approved <laughs> massive changes to our zoning regulations. And one of those changes was that we set the adjacent property owner's notification distance to a half mile. So, um, there's a couple places in the, in the subdivision regulations which also need to say that, and so that is the purpose of this text amendment, is to change the, a section of the preliminary plot and the final plot section to say that neighbors within a quarter mile will be notified. That way the zoning regs are consistent with the subdivision regs. All right, very good. Questions or comments to this idea? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Boyle, second by Commissioner Rogers. Questions or comments? Then could we please vote? Uh, Commissioner Cavanaugh, how do you vote? Oh, yes. oh, yes, okay, motion passes six to zero. Thank you. The final public hearing, item D, is adoption of the 2018 International Electric Conservation Code. Uh, Doug? So recently the state updated uh, their version from the 2009 edition to the 2018. Uh, we follow the state in regards to this, so we would ask that you adopt the 2018 IECC as recommended by the Planning Commission. Very good. Any, Commissioner Boyle? Uh, Mr. Gart, does, does this add any uh, further 
uh, regulation over business or uh, people who want to uh, do work of any sort, like uh, permits or different kinds of uh, equipment or uh, materials they have to use? I, I wouldn't say that it would. Uh, this kind, this code deals with like windows, um, insulation, conservation type energy saving okay. things. So to my knowledge, no, it does not. Okay, well do me a favor and kind of keep an eyeball on it. And some okay. of these things, uh, uh, after a year or so, you discover that it's switching some kind of material for you know the windows or whatever it is, and, and it adds expense and things like that, and it causes hardship for uh, consumers as well as uh, people who are installing them. So if you keep an eyeball on that, I'd appreciate it and let us know. Roger but that. On, only if it only if it's is detrimental, you don't have to come back and but keep a eyeball, will you? Yes, sir. Thanks. Any other comments during the public hearing? If not, I will close the public hearing. Motion to approve. I will second that. Questions or comments to the motion? Then I would call for the vote. Doug, thank you very much. You, don't, you really do a good job all the time. You're Motion another, passes six to zero. You're another one of the standouts. I, pr I appreciate uh, that. Thanks a lot. Thank I'll you. see if I can get you a pass. Thank you, commissioners. Right just a second, Doug. I think. Did, oh. Did my vote register last time because I saw that there was only a five to okay. one? It did. It was uh, Commissioner Kavanaugh's oh, vote who I was missing. Yep. Right. Okay. Take care. I'll try to get you a pass to the drive in. <laughs> I'll bring in my own popcorn. <laughs> yes, don't tell him though. <laughs> Thanks, right. Doug. This brings us down to uh, anything on the budget report. No, I think we've done the damage. I mean, done the work. All right, good. Uh, item A2 under Finance Committee is approval of a resolution setting the preliminary tax rates for miscellaneous subdivisions as provided by Nebraska Statute 77-3443. Yeah. Okay. Motion and a second. Questions or comments? Then could we please vote? Motion passes six to zero. Thank you. Uh, at this point, Commissioner Borgeson, Commissioner Borgeson asked early on if she could have a point of privilege in this meeting, this, and uh, this would be a good opportunity for that. Sir, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have just a couple of things, and as you know, this month is Suicide um, Prevention Awareness Month, and I just wanted to put up a couple of um, flyers, and um, this one in particular, I think is useful because it gives um, numbers, and um, so over 44,000 Americans die of suicide every year. And suicide is the fourth leading cause of death for people between the ages of 18 and 65. And for every death by suicide, there are over 25 suicide attempts. And suicide can be prevented, and that's the message that I'd like to send today. And you may ask, well, what can we do? And this next flyer, is pretty simple things that we can do. So when you're approaching someone or you think someone is in need of someone to talk to, just ask. Ask if they're okay. And listen. And again, listen to hear what they're saying. Stay with them, secure, and then call the number there on the line, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And again, it, it takes all of us to be aware of the signs, it takes all of us to open up our arms and our hearts to someone who's struggling. And don't ever take for granted uh, someone's position on how they are because they're, they could be carrying around a very big burden and just don't have anyone to talk to or turn to. And so again, this is the Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. I just wanted us to again bring it to the forefront and um, and really, really pay attention and be there for those um, that are struggling. And during this COVID, we've heard 
that there are people who are struggling with the isolation, struggling with their depression and anxiety. And again, if you can lend a, a helping hand or an ear or, or a hug, uh, let's do that. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you. Borson. Yeah. Commissioner Boyle. I, I, I really, I really um, appreciate that a lot. I think it's, um, uh, my family's uh, uh, suffered from that uh, suicide and, and it's very, very difficult. Um, and the, I think the, um, something I saw on television the other day was really remarkable, and I don't mean to, that, that presentation you no, had was excellent, good. but what I heard on television was a man who lived in San Francisco, and he was suicidal, and he was, uh, uh, he, and it's about, probably because he was in San Francisco, but as he walked on the street, went to the grocery store, well, nobody ever spoke to him, nobody, nobody ever saw him. He just was talking about how lonely he felt, even though he was in a crowd, and all this sort of thing, and he had decided that if somebody talked to him about uh, taking his life, that uh, he wouldn't do it. Well, he walked to the Golden Gate Bridge, and, and uh, he was there, and as he's contemplating going over the side, someone walked up to him, and he thought, this is, this is it. And he said, uh, the guy said, do you know of a good restaurant in Sausalito? And uh, he said, no, and then uh, the guy walked away, and the fellow jumped up, and he did jump, he survived. Mm. But he jumped off the bridge to commit suicide. No one spoke to him. So you know what I've done? I, I, I this is, of course, I'm a. I drive my family a little bit crazy. <laughs> I was at my son Mike's house, and there are people walking by on the other side of the street, and I'm going, "Hey, how are you?" And waving at him, and he goes, "What are you doing?" You know. And uh, so I said, "I'm just being friendly." To people I said, well, "You're being weird." I said, "No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really." I said, "What's amazing is uh, when you're walking like to the grocery store, and there's people coming out, and there's a." A woman who has, a, who has, a, uh, she's a Muslim and she has the hat, the, she's dressed fully, you know. And so what I do is uh, I, I go by them and I always speak to them and I nod out of respect. I don't, I never try to touch them or anything, but just say good morning to them and you can see them smile and so forth. Good morning. Mm -hmm. And yesterday I was at UNMC and there's a, a African black couple walking out and uh, I, I talked to everybody and just say how are you doing? And you'd be surprised with smiles that come mm -hmm. up and just good. It's just. What it says to somebody is, I see you, I, right. you, you, you exist. And uh, anyway, so it turns out this guy, his wife was uh, worked at Corrections and she was a sergeant and uh, they were getting in their truck and stuff and I was visiting with them. And, and then he said something so kind about Anne, it was just really nice, how much he respected oh. her and stuff, just out of the blue. And uh, so that's, it helped me, you know, I mean, I'm not thinking <laughs> about that, but I mean, the point is that we all need to recognize people in grocery stores, speak to them, say hello, just takes a minute and it's really surprising. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, when I see a, a man or a woman with little kids, I say, oh, you got your helpers. And I'll say, oh yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> so, but just acknowledging somebody. So I appreciate you're doing this yeah. and uh, it's really important. I think we ought to probably once in a while flash up a number on the screen for a suicide mm -hmm. help or something because it's really rampant. I talked to a friend uh, out of town and they have not been out of their home since March mm -hmm. and uh, it's getting weird. Mm -hmm. So. We need to help people. Thanks a lot, Marianne, it was well, great. That's, that's exactly what we need to do, Commissioner Boyle, is just um, take the time to say hello. Yeah. That's it, sounds smile. Like, sounds like we're all in this together. That's yep. right. Uh, that's that is a great message, and thank yep. you for bringing it to our attention. And the second real quick item, and she's left the chamber, and she's probably gonna kill me for announcing this, but I'm gonna do it anyway, um, that our own Kim have a cotty. Oh, oh yeah has been nominated by Congressman Bacon um, as the Nebraska recipient for the Angels in Adoption Award through the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute. And if there is anyone who is, yeah. uh, boy, more deserving than this, I, I don't know, but Kim is the one. Um, she's been such an addition, great addition to our staff when it comes to um, our juvenile justice issues and the work um, that she's done since she's been here and to be honored like this and recognized like this and continue the work on it um, is phenomenal. So we congratulate her for that. Good can, point. I, can I add, I think she said she won too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was beyond nominating. She, she won the I'm award. sorry, I missed, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. I read it wrong. Uh, thank you for, uh, yeah, yeah, good. Good people we have helping us. Yes, absolutely we Certainly do. Very fine. Thank yeah. you. Okay, um, I really see nothing further on the agenda. I don't think we need to talk about legislative issues too much. I hope not. Um, 
so this in my mind brings us down to executive session we do have need for an executive session for litigation and negotiations uh, so I'll make uh, the motion that we go into executive session also the zoom meetings are not really uh, <laughs> I mean, see the mic's not on omit having our executive sessions on Zoom. And I know that it, that's fairly accurate. I don't know if others have heard that. Uh, you know, I just think we should not be doing that. And I appreciate Mark Kraft and what he does. And, you know, I think um, we I, can make sure he's updated about it. I, well, I have not heard that. Uh, is, He's is there, heard it, there, yes. Oh, golly, shucks. Yeah. Uh, well, shucks. Sorry, Mark. We're not secure. We'll, no, I, I, we will pass. It's not just Mark Kraft. This is basic public health hygiene, not to go into that small room uh, during this pandemic. Uh, Zooms um, can be made uh, as secure as a law office. I know this because we use them for legal stuff, as do the courts. So whatever we have to do to make Zoom uh, secure should be done to preserve the security of our collective health rather than sacrifice our health because somebody doesn't want to do the, the sure. needed security app on Zoom doesn't, to me, make a lot of sense. Commissioner Boyle. Well, uh, it's a good point. We could, you know, I suppose these rooms back here, you could close those things and we could have a pretty good sized room for privacy there if we ever wanted to do that one of these rooms back here. The other thing is maybe go to 903. I don't have a problem with that at all. That's, you know, I mean, I understand. I mean, well, this we went to 903. Last time Commissioner Kavanaugh complained about being in this room, we moved up to 903 and he didn't come to the meeting. And so we all said, why did we move out of this room for a commissioner that isn't even coming? And what? at that point, we came back down here. Okay. Well, I, I understand that you probably don't have a grasp of the technology involved in secure <laughs> Zoom calls for public health purposes, but the whole world's using them. I don't know why the Douglas County Board can't. We will catch you up to speed later, Mark, uh, on what's going on here. So Thank go you. behind closed doors, and uh, I hope well, you stay well. I, I yeah. Thank you very much. Well, there's a Zoom you, app here that can be as secure as any okay. office. Okay, we have a motion courtroom. to adjourn. We don't want to use it. Wait. I understand that you want to have... We still need a second, talk. Commissioner Duda. Uh, I will second... Our Commissioner Boyle seconds. Let us vote on going into executive session for negotiations and, and litigation. I don't think Commissioner Boyle voted. <laughs> All right, other than Commissioner Duda, I pretty much, I, I assume everyone's voting yes. I assume so. Yes, yes. Commissioner Boyle, Commissioner Kavanaugh, are you voting yes? Yes. Commissioner Kavanaugh. I'm not going to vote unless we have an accessible. I, we don't care if you vote. I'm voting no. All right, motion passes. Commissioner Kavanaugh voting no, other commissioners voting yes.